Oh, no, listen. No, you don't blow on it. They just call it that. No. Oh, we're back. <laughs> Here, hold my phone, Gabe. Um, actually, we're not back. We're just starting. Yes, yeah, so we're starting. Check uh, one, two. Oh, wait, this is at the mic. Check one, two. We are Check ready for one, two. volume three <clears throat> of Secrets of the Ring with Ray. Who's volume four? Three? Uh, I believe it's three. Oh, is it, well, how many are we in? I don't know, we're in three or four of the uh, the other series. We're going on and on and with both how, of them. The series of how to make Raven money without actually trying. <laughs> so, and filter uh, and wander through the Gabe Sapolsky account. <laughs> volume three will be uh, odds and ends, various things that don't really fit in. We will, uh, you know, of course, have working as a heel in the future, promos in the future, but there's a whole bunch of miscellaneous stuff that doesn't fit in any miscellaneous of those Miscellaneous stuff. So uh, why don't we begin with lock Locker room etiquette. Locker room etiquette. Without further ado, um, it's really funny. Like um, one of the biggest things that I was taught in this business, and probably why I had so much trouble. Well, actually, I didn't have that much. This isn't why I had trouble, but it's respect in the business. Like I, I never really had trouble with that aspect of it. I think I was just generally a disrespectful bastard, but I always had respect for the veterans. Um, the, um, and it's funny because today, today people are being trained by guys, you know, like Joe Schmo, who was trained by Dick Dovehead, who was trained by Larry Lemonhead, and who was trained by Tommy Tomatohead. You know, and none of these guys were actually trained by a star or somebody who was a good worker. You know, um, anybody can open a school these days. You know, some guy that's had 50 indie matches could open a school, and he could say, oh, um, and maybe he did dark matches for the WWE as an enhancement guy or a jobber, as we used to call it. The enhancement was actually to make it sound more, you know, nice. But yeah, just a jobber. I mean, and um, and so he, he was on, so he was, oh, I wrestled on WWE. Well, no, you, you, were, you worked some dark matches. And so he might open a school and train somebody else. And the one thing they don't teach, and they don't teach respect. And now that I think about it, I don't think Larry Sharp taught me that either. I had to learn that the hard way as well. But I, I kind of picked it up quick. Yes and no. Um, here's what I'm getting at. The, um... There's different aspects of it. I mean, the old, the, all right, the, um, I went to Larry Sharp's Monster Factory, and Larry was in Japan the whole time, so I was trained by Charlie Fulton. And Charlie was one of those old time hands where he was one of those guys who was employed. Okay, he wasn't just an enhancement guy and a job on TV. He worked the whole circuit. I mean, and he worked the circuit for years and years. He was like a 20, 25 year veteran. This guy's a hell of a worker, but as we talked about on the uh, previous tape about charisma and, and uh, star power, he didn't really have that. He was just known as a good hand, which is now, it's, now being known as a good hand is the kiss of death. Um, but back then he was a good hand, which meant he was always going to be employed, always going to have work, but he's never going to rise above a certain level because he didn't have that certain star power. And um, so he trained me, and he wasn't the, um, it was a quiet guy, a very nice guy. I, I got nothing more respect for him. He was just a phenomenal worker, um, quiet guy. And he was just, you know, taught to train me how to work. I mean, frankly, I only went to school for a month. I mean, basically, after a month, Larry's like, look, there's nothing else I can teach you. You need to go wrestle in front of people. And I still came around a couple times a week, but it took me like eight months to get into a territory. But, um, you know, after sending my pictures out, um, basically what I'm getting at here is that, Actually, okay, I, I tend to meander a bit, so I'm going to try and keep this in some kind of order. So, I'll, you know, I'll get off the subject, but I'll get back on it. But, so, I send my pictures out. I would take, you know, you, you make a videotape. You know, and I had like five matches at that point, I think. I think in the, eight, in the first nine months I was in the business, I had seven or eight matches. So, I don't even count that. I count from the day I went full-time, which was February 20th, uh, 1988, and I was in Memphis. But, um... I had a, my first match, my second match, then I went to Puerto Rico and did three jobs on a TV, like they take three TVs in one day and threw them in one night, so I did three jobs. I think I had like three other matches, one was like a battle royal that they threw me in. I mean, I didn't have a lot of work, but the whole point was, you know, you can only go to a school for so long, which I want to talk about that. Well, actually, I'll talk about that first. I'll get the respect as I go. Um, how do these guys spend two years in the wrestling school? Who the hell is like, I'll talk to people and they're like, oh, they don't think I'm ready yet. What the fuck? If you can't pick it up in six months, what the fuck are you doing? What are you, an idiot? I mean, to me, I don't get that. Look, there's headlocks, there's arm bars, there's arm drags, there's back bumps, there's hitting the ropes. That's your basic shit. After that, you need to be in front of an audience to learn how to put it together because you can do all the shit you want in the school. All the shit. And uh, hang on a sec. This is why you always carry a snot rag. <laughs> anyway, the, um, you can do all, learn all the fucking moves in the school, but if you don't know how to work in front of people, what the fuck? Which is, I talked about that a little bit before on a previous tape. 
you have to interact with the fans. So you can learn all the moves you want at the school, but at some point, once you, I mean, look, how hard is it to learn how to take a back bump? How long is it? To learn, how hard is it to learn how to take a headlock? All those things. Then you got to go in front of people and put it all together. And sure, you're gonna fuck up, but there's nothing wrong with fucking up. In fact, you will probably learn more from your mistakes than you ever will from the stuff you get correct. And to be honest, you shouldn't fear mistakes. You know, you should, you should, like I know a lot of people who go out of their way not to fuck up. Basically, they're they're trying to. Um, they only do half what they could because they'd much rather do half as good as they could and not fuck up than go for the whole ball of wax and fuck up. And I'd much rather fuck up, you know, and go for it. Um, I think it's a much. Uh, it's the way it should be done. Um, you know, basically, it's like either playing it safe or going for it, like uh, Kevin Costner and Tin Cup, and uh, Don Johnson who would lay up, and Tim Costner and Kevin Costner went for it, which that was a hell of a movie, by the way. I love that movie, and what I liked about it too was that um, in the beginning they all talked in golf language, like in the wrestling business, up until the last half dozen years, eight, six, eight years, when the business became an influx of guys that never really paid their dues or learned the business and stopped talking in the wrestling lingo. We used to apply, like, people would, like, in, in the movie Tin Cup, like, in the beginning of the movie, everything they talked about, whether picking up girls or whatever, they're talking about it in, like, golf language. That's how the wrestling business was. Like, you go to a movie, go, oh, look at the top heel. Uh, he wasn't selling for the baby face. I mean, everything was put in wrestling lingo, and then the wrestling vernacular, and then as the business changed and guys got in the business who weren't, uh, who weren't trained, who didn't pay their dues, whatever, which isn't their fault, it became it's, it became a different business. I mean, you know, in many ways a, good, a positive thing, you know, because in the old days everybody was a drunk and a drug addict. You know, now there's you know a lot of guys that don't drink or do drugs at all, which is much better. Um, you know, take it from someone who knows. Um, whatever, that, that's a moot point. Um, Wow, did I meander off course? Anyway, so whatever the fuck you're doing in the school for two years is just fucking absurd. If you're that bad an athlete, you probably aren't really going to make it. Um, and if you have enough charisma, then you don't really need to be able to work. You know, as we talked about before, you know, if you have enough star power, you don't have to be that good a worker. I mean, you have to get in front of people to work. Um, and that's where you listen to the people. Because in a school, there's no noise. Like, I, I often thought if I was ever going to open a school, I would either get like a... A soundtrack of people yaying and booing, you know, and when it's, you know, I would press a button, yay, or to boo, you know what I mean? So the people could respond to it, you know? And I would have different, so or I would just make the students, which is probably what I would do, is I'd get, you know, make the other 15, 20 students sit around and be the audience and make a lot of fucking noise and burn out their vocal cords screaming and booing and hooting and hollering, because I, I want to, you know, you have to react to the people. You're doing something, they're reacting to it, and you're reacting to them reacting to you. It's that fucking simple. Um, the, uh, so, hang on a sec. So I spent a month at Larry Sharp School for the most part, going three, I think probably four or five days a week, or as many days as it was open, nights. And, um, the month he's like, I, I have nothing else I can teach you, you gotta go territory. So I set out my pictures the tape and here's the thing like nowadays everybody expects well um, like they're owed a fucking job no you're not owed anything this is the thing you know it's like oh, I, when I, I, and I really respect this out of Larry when I um I was trying to find a school, and I wanted to go to Malenko's, but I could find no contact information on it. So, I, And the ones I did find, the one I liked the most was Larry Sharp, because I thought he had the most prestige because he was in Sports Illustrated because of Bam Bam Bigelow, and they had a big article about him, and I thought that's the best chance of you know making it somewhere. And uh, as a sidebar, I paid three grand in 87, and it's like three grand to go to wrestling school now, so the only thing that has defied inflation is wrestling school. <laughs> We got that going for us, which is nice. So, um, yeah, and so Larry told me, I said to him, I said, look, I go, is this going to guarantee me you know, any kind of break? He's like, he goes, no. He goes, does college guarantee you a job? No, because I'm going to give you an education and you do with it whatever you can. And I really respect him for being that honest. He goes, I'll guarantee you one match, which he did. He came through on that. He actually came through on two matches. Actually, he got me like five matches. But he really didn't do much for me because he didn't see much in me. I wasn't a big guy. And I really had to make my own career. And then, of course, now I'm on the wall, you know, the wall of fame, you know, because I made it somewhere. But, you know, I did that on my own. But, um, and that's neither here nor there. The, um, the point being is that, uh, what is the point? Well, I can get off some subjects. Um, the, uh, what the hell was I just talking about? People oh. being owed something, or oh yeah. So anyway, so yeah, so so um, 
<laughs> so anyways, I respect the fact that Larry only, you know, Larry told me, because I got on so many tangents, I can't remember which tangent I was talking about. So I respect the fact that Larry told me, you know, I can just guarantee you one, you know, one thing, one match. Um, and today's guys, they're like, somebody owes them, like somebody owes them a fucking job. Nobody owes you anything. You will get a job, and then more importantly, you will get a push when you earn it. We didn't, uh, and I said this before, I'm going to say it again, I said it on the last tape. If, um... You don't get a push. In the old days, we didn't get a push just because it was our turn. In fact, in the old days, like probably right up until I was getting into business, it took you five to seven years of being a journeyman before you were actually given 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 a shot, and you had to have some star power to get a shot. Then you weren't just given the range, you know, the fucking you know free reign. Hey, let's give them a push. It just doesn't happen that way. And today, everybody thinks somebody owes them push. Oh, the office won't push me. The office won't push me. It's not the office's job to push you. It's your job to get over, and then they will try and run with you. That's how it always worked. And maybe it should be different, but I don't think so because, to me, if I'm if I'm the office and I don't see you doing anything to stand out why would I put the ball you know, in, in your hands you know what I mean unless you're doing something and just being in ring isn't quite enough um, so Larry promised me one match and he gave me my one match and he didn't really teach me about the respect part of the business and uh you pick it up. You pick it up. You know, he didn't teach me Carney. You know, um, he didn't teach me a lot of stuff. And uh, on some levels, I think he should have. And in fact, I think on most levels, I think he should have. But I picked it up rather quick. Um, I was lucky enough that when I got to my first territory, Memphis, I um, actually when I went to my first indie shows, you know. Oh, the guys, the, the other young guys would tell you to go. Hey, listen, when you get, when you walk in the locker room, say, shake hands with everybody. That that's the simplest. That is wrestling 101. That is the very 101 step A or step 1A or whatever. Um, wrestling 101. One. Walk in the locker room. You shake hands with everybody. You put your bag down when you walk in. You don't even walk to your chair and put it down. As soon as you walk in, when you're if you're that low on a totem pole, and most of you guys are that low on a totem pole. I mean, if, you, if you're not that low, you won't be like. I don't think anybody who's higher on a totem pole is going to be watching this videotape. Not that they don't need to, or not that some of them shouldn't, but I don't think they will. Um, you walk in, you say hello. I'm Joe Blow. Hey, 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 I'm Joe Blow. You don't see that anymore. Nobody does that anymore, and it's a shame because that shows respect. That shows respect to everybody in the locker room, and it shows respect that you're new and you you know you're introducing yourself. And, and to be honest, even like um. Even now, I still say hi to everybody. I mean, I don't know. I don't the minute I walk in, but I mean, because I'm a veteran, I don't have to do my first thing. But if you're a green guy and you're new and you're first couple years in the business, you walk in, especially the stars. And then a lot of times, guys will be like, "Wow, I was too intimidated." I'm like, well, I don't give a fuck. That's part of your job anyway. You know, it's like uh, I learned that the hard way with Mr. Fuji. Mr. Fuji was the uh, well, not the hard way. I almost learned the hard way. Um, Mr. Fuji is the all-time king of the ribs. And, uh, I mean, he is, like, the angle where he did where Al Snow was fed his own dog by the boss man, that was actually a shoot thing that Mr. Fuji did to his next-door neighbor because the damn dog kept bothering him. And uh, Fuji kept telling the guy to quit it. Fuji w was a guy known for, uh, there's another odds in that, in the ribbing. Fuji was known for, uh, I remember he told me a story that, uh, well, I'll get to the story in a sec. But anyway, so... I was so intimidated by Mr. Fuji that when I walk in the locker, like I guess I didn't say hi to him. Well, I wouldn't talk to him. And then, um, and then like, Brian Adams pulls me aside, who I knew from Portland. He's like, "What the fuck? You got big heat with Fuji?" I'm like, "Wow, what the fuck did I do?" And this was like five, six, seven years in the business, and so I already know to shake hands with everybody. So I know, I know what it was. It wasn't that I was shaking hands. It was that I wasn't going up and talking to him? He's like, "He thinks you don't like him." I'm like, "No, I just I'm intimidated." It's like yeah, it doesn't matter. So I went up and started talking to him. We became friends. Um, you know, everybody's just real people. Everybody's normal people. I and mean, they may not want to be your friend. They may want to. They may not. They may get like a rat's ass. But out of respect, you owe it to walk up to every single person. Hello, I'm Joe Blow, and introduce yourself. And, and what I don't get is guys will walk up and say hi to me, and they don't tell me who the fuck they are. Like, how the fuck am I going to know who the fuck you are? I don't even watch WWE. You know, I don't, you know, TNA. I watch TNA. So I know who all the TNA guys are. But I don't watch WWE. I don't watch any of the indie stuff. So how the fuck am I going to know? So if you just walk up to me and go, Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? I'm Raven. Nice to meet you. And they walk away and I'm like, What a schmuck. Like, you know, they expect me to know who they are. That's not how it works. And even if I do know who they are, that's still not how the business works. It's like... You know, if uh, if you were to go to an if you were going to if you got an acting part and Clint Eastwood is there, you don't just walk up and go, hey, how you doing, Clint? 
you know, you'd say, hey, listen, I, I just wanted to come up and meet you. I'm, you know, I'm Gabe Sapolsky, Mr. Eastwood, and it's nice to meet you. He's like, ah, call me Clint, you know. Or he'd be like, ah, get the fuck out of here, Sapolsky. You know, one of the two, but that's still your obligation. That's what this business was founded on, respect, because if you really think about it, you're giving your body to somebody else. You're giving them your body. So if they don't, if you don't have any, if there's no respect on any level, why the fuck should they give you their body back, or why the fuck, you know, th this whole business is based on respect. We're giving ourselves to somebody else, so that which, by the same token, anybody who takes liberties with you is being a piece of shit because you're giving your body. You're not trying to resist. You're not trying to fight back. So just respect in this business is so built into the very fabric of it that it starts right from the beginning, you know. And so you introduce yourself. And the uh, the Fuji rib that I remember him telling me was. He did a, which I'll get back to the respecting, but before I forget about the Fuji thing, he, I think he was telling me, I think it was Mr. Saito, or Mr. S yeah, Mr. Saito, I think, or one of the, Mr. Sato or Saito. Anyway, so he just come to, to America, and it was going to be partners with Mr. Fuji, and he didn't, um, he didn't speak good English or anything, I guess, or whatever, and um, so Fuji goes, oh, we got, we got a long day tomorrow, I get to sleep early. So he goes to sleep, and he gets up early, he meets at Mr. Fuji's house like 9 a.m., and they drive and drive, and they drive like six, seven hours to get to the show, right? And Mr. Fuji makes him, uh, how did it work, did Mr. Fuji make him, I guess, I guess Mr. Fuji made him drive. So Mr. Fuji makes him drive, he drives like seven hours to the show, right? And then on the ride back, fucking Mr. Fuji drives, and they get home in ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, ah, right, we're back. We must have taken a shortcut. And it's so fucking great that Fuji was willing to rib himself just to rib the other guy. It's fucking greatest thing. And uh, I love that story. Anyway, so the respect starts right at the beginning. Um, there's an interesting item that me and Gabe were talking about that is what prompted this discussion. And um, I was at a show a couple weeks ago. And it was me, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't in the match, but me and Rick Steiner rode together. And he was supposed to wrestle this, Vor him and Dustin, no, him and Vordell, Wa him, and, him and somebody were supposed to wrestle Vordell Walker and Eric Dustin. Stevens. It was him and Eric Stevens against Dustin Rhodes and Vordell Walker. All right, that's who it was. And um, so I, Rick doesn't know who these guys are. Rick doesn't even know who he's working. I mean, I come to these indie shows, I don't know who I'm, not only do I not know who I'm working, but this is what, this is how it, how it works. We make it, like a promoter calls me up because I'd like you to work for blah, blah, blah. I'm like, all right. How much money? I say this is what I want. This is what I, this is what I need. Blah blah blah. So I write down what I'm getting. If I don't write everything down, I forget. I write down what I'm getting and where I'm and where and sometimes and usually where I'm going, just so I know what town I'm going to be in, and um, and the guy's phone number and the guy's name. That's it. I don't need anything else. So people go, oh, you're working for APWJLW Wrestling. I'm like. Okay, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not trying to be, you know, arrogant. But why would I know? I don't watch it. It doesn't, you know, it, it's if it's not in your purview. Why? Why would it? It's not, it's not functional to me to need to know any of this information. I'm going there to perform. You know, it's like I don't think uh, I don't think Jerry Seinfeld needs to know who all the other comics are in the lineup when he's performing at the Punchline. I think he knows. You know, if he's going to Yuck Yucks and you know, in Bumblefuck, you know, uh, Idaho. I think all he knows is he's going to Bumblefuck, Idaho. Someone will pick him up. Someone will drop him off. And his set's going to be X amount of time. And he's going to get paid X amount of money. He doesn't know who the opening act is. He doesn't know. Well, it, it, it just, it's, not, it's not necessary information. It is when you're coming up. But once you reach a certain level, it no longer is. And uh, so anyway, so... We were at the show, so you know, it's nine times out of ten. I don't, not only do I not know who I'm wrestling, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't even know the name of the damn promotion. And I'll get there and I'll say, oh, and the guy will come over and say, oh, listen, I'm Joe Blow and I'm wrestling you tonight. I'm like, all right, cool. I said, why don't you come back and find me? You know, in six hours and we'll go over it. You know, I mean, not six hours, but you know, I'll be like, all right, come back. I go, all right, what's it now? Hour before the show starts. Um, what are we on? Last. Uh, so many matches. Eight matches. So I don't know. Come find me around second, third match. We'll put something together. You know, and then I may I may put something together, I may not, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, but that's how it goes. So apparently this Vordell Walker guy and this other the promoter brings him into the well, me and me and Rick, because it was really hot day, it was in Florida. And there was a there was a separate locker room for the name guys and a separate locker room for the other guys. And they were in a tent outside and we were in a we were in a building where it's, there's air conditioning. And then me and Rick had sequestered ourselves in another room in that thing because Lawler had brought his whole family. 
guess he brought his girlfriend and then their, or what, their sister's kids or something. There was, and there was like a baby running around on a blanket. And the other one had more air conditioning. And plus there was a bunch of people. And you know, and then uh, Ricky Morton and them, they were all talking Memphis stuff. And you know, plus with the baby and the family, it, just, it was uncomfortable. You know, because we were trying to get dressed. So me and Rick went in the other room. And so we're sitting in there. And uh, we're just bullshitting. And a promoter comes in, introduces... I, I, I vaguely remember this, but introduces Vordell, I guess. I don't know if he introduced the other guy. I think he just introduced Vordell. Yeah, because I think I already knew who I was working. Introduces Vordell, and then me and Rick, and then Rick started, um, says something, whatever, blows the guy off or whatever. And, and and basically, Rick thought the guy was, he brought the guy in to meet me, you know, to work, because he was working with me. That's who Rick thought I was working. So Rick blows it off. He didn't think it had anything to do with him, so he just completely blows it off. Um... And then later on, and they, and they never talk again. The guy never comes back. The guy never says, look, Rick, you know, we need to go over his match. Nothing. Doesn't say anything. So later on in the match, the match starts, and fucking um, Rick tries to work with the guy. The guy doesn't want to do The guy doesn't do anything. Rick punches him like ten times. The guy won't go down. So finally, Rick stiffs the crap out of him, and then fucking uh, lets the guy go, says, get him the fuck out of here or something, and the other guy, and then... Of course, in the, in, the, in the sheets, it comes across that this guy fucking, you know, could have killed Rick and blah, 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 and Rick gassed out, and, you know, Gabe saw the tape, and it, it was nothing even remotely like that, you know, it's yeah. basically, how did it go, Gabe? It was, Rick just started kicking the guy in the face, kicking Vordell, and had him down, and then, I mean, I guess that Rick gassed out, I could be wrong. I, I would imagine he just let the guy out, because I think he... Yeah, and then the guy got on top of Rick, and then that was pretty much it, then it was, it was pretty much Vordell. Yeah. yeah. And so anyway, so then they come back, and the guy's all upset and his lips pretty split open. He got it pretty he stood pretty hard, right? And uh he's, like, blah, blah, blah. he's bitching a fit and I'm like, what's the matter? He's like, ah, we're fucking beat it. He goes, well at least I got my kicks in. I'm like his buddy says, yeah, you got your kicks in. And of course, Gabe saw it. The guy didn't get any kicks in, but whatever. That's not the point. My point is, is the guy was all upset. And I'm like, well, what's the problem? I go, why didn't you get with Rick? He goes, I did. He goes, the, the promoter brought me in, and he blew me off. I go, well, first of all, I go, does Rick even know who the fuck you are? Does Rick even know who the fuck he's working? And second of all, did you go up to Rick a second time and say, listen, I'm not trying to be a dick, but out of respect, um, you and I are working. Could, could we go over this? He goes, well, he goes, no. I'm like, well, then it's your fucking fault. I mean... You know, I, I, I don't know if he deserved to be kicked, but I mean, obviously, if, you, if you're wrestling Steiner and he's punching you, you're not taking a bump, then I can imagine why he's going to fucking stiff you. I mean, because Rick, Rick came back and I went to Rick and get Rick's version of it, and Rick's like, yeah, because I kept hitting the guy and he wouldn't go down. I was like, fuck, so finally I fucking knocked him down. I mean, if Steiner hits you, why aren't you bumping in the first place anyway? You know what I mean? That's, you know, that just goes beyond me to begin with. That's, you know... Yeah, that'd be like fucking, you know, I can understand if a guy 120 hits you and you don't go down, but fucking Steiner's 265, 270 with a reputation. Let alone his shoot reputation, just his character's reputation is a tough guy. So you need to go down for him. But so anyway, so I was like, so, and then Rick was like, I'm like, man, the kid's all fucking beat up. The kid feels all bad and stuff. He's like, oh, fuck, I, I feel bad. So Rick went to apologize, which, you know, so, I mean, having having no idea with this kid claiming that he was going to beat him up or, you know, whatever he claims in the sheets in his website, which is completely not how it happened because I was there for the whole thing. Um, anyway... What pissed me off is then I'm trying to explain to the kid. I'm like, look, it's your responsibility to find Rick. It's like, well, me and the promoter, when the promoter brought me in there, I'm like, and Rick goes, look, he goes, I didn't know he was, he goes, I thought you were working Raven. He goes, I mean, if you really, to me, I, I don't, what I don't get is, and it shows a complete lack of respect, and it shows a complete arrogance to me, is that, and I told him that, I was like, look, I go, we don't know who you are. How would we know who you are? How would we know who we're working and how, like, I see my name against some guy, and no offense to Vordell, but I see my name against some guy. I don't know who the fuck he is half the time because there's so many guys in the business. I mean, back then, everybody knew everybody because everybody was on TV. Everybody was on a TV show. Everybody had sort of a name value. Now there's all these guys that are in the business that somebody trained that nobody knows even who the guy that trained them was. And so there's a proliferation of guys. And it's like, like I remember Mikey I showed the other night. I mean, I'm sorry, Mikey I showed the other night. I was on it, Mikey Whipwreck. And we had to wrestle these two guys. I didn't know who they were. I mean, but they were nice guys, and they came up and like, hey, let's go, you know. And I'm like, ah, let's go over there. Oh, that's fine, you know. And they were totally cool, totally respectful, you know, because I'm sure Mikey trained them, you know, so they taught respect. And it's just, it, it boggled my mind that the kid never tried a second time to find Rick, you know, to go ask Rick. The kid just said, all right, I guess we're calling in the ring, which Rick never said either. He never said we're calling it in the ring. He didn't say anything to the guy because he didn't know that's who he was wrestling. And why... Let's just say, let's just say Rick was 100% wrong. 
my point is, is if you don't know for sure and it's a misunderstanding, you're the green guy. It's your responsibility to find out. And that irritates me to no end that people think, well, I've been in the business three years. Well, Rick's been in the business 20 years, you know. It just it infuriates me. Like I used to get, I would get so pissed when I'd be in a locker room, and guys would come in, like say TNA or WCW, and they'd walk in and sit down, and they wouldn't come say introduce themselves. I was like, fucking infuriates me. And guys would be like, well, they're they're, they're nervous. I'm like, yeah, but still, that's their job. And it, it's a shame because when you're being trained by a guy who doesn't know any better, you don't know any better, and so and so so. If the, if I believe the guy doesn't know it, then it doesn't bother me so much, you know. But if I know the guy knows and he just doesn't do it, that fucking infuriates me because that's part of that's your job. That is part of your job description is to walk up and introduce yourself and say, "Hey, I'm Joe Blow, and uh, nice to meet you." And uh, especially if you're working with the guy, you know what I mean. And I don't know how many times, you know, promoters have come up to me, you know, and I'm like, "Well, who am I working?" And they're like, "Oh, this guy." I'm like, "All right," and uh, you know, and I don't know how many times that guys have just been like, you know. Well, I got to go find the guy who I'm working with, you know, and I'm like, why, why the fuck, you know, I spent 18 years in the 17 years in this business. I shouldn't have to go find anybody now. You know what I mean? And, I, and that's not arrogance. You know, that's just the way the business is. When I got in the business, if I was working, say, Samu, you know, been in business five, six, seven years before me, I would definitely go, I'd go find, hey, excuse me, Samu, listen, I'm uh, Raven, listen, you and I are working together, um, what do you, is there anything you want to do tonight? Is there anything like, you know? And nowadays, guys are like, hey, listen, um, I got an idea. I'd like to do this and this and this. I'm like, wait a minute. Why don't you ask me if you can get it in? You know, guys are like, ah, I'd like to do this and this. Like, hey, I thought we'd do this, this. No, you didn't think anything. You'll ask me if I want to do it. You know, I mean, if we're on the same level, we've both been in the business 5, 10, 15 years. And by five, I mean five full time. I don't mean five where you're working like, you know, a couple weekends a month. You know what I mean? Because then five years is really, you know, if you only work a couple weekends a month, um, then to, when you have five years, it's really like having two years. Because I had, let me think, when you started, you worked 250, 300 nights a year. My first year in a business, I had over 300 matches, which if you work, if you work every weekend, that's uh, eight weekends a month, that's 50, there's 52 weeks in a year. So if you work, that's 104 shows. If you worked every single, it would take you three years if you worked every single weekend without fail, just to have the amount of matches that I had in one year, you know. And nobody works every, every fucking weekend. So it probably takes you five years to have the same thing I had in one year. So I think I've earned it. It's kind of like Jack Nicholson and a few good men. He goes, he goes, I've earned the right to be called Colonel. You know what I mean? I've earned the right to fucking sit there and have some kid you know, find me and me not have to go look for him. And me not have the kid go, listen, I want to do this, this, and this. As in the old days, you would walk up and you go, hey, listen, um, I'm working you, um, blah, blah, whatever you'd like to do. And the guy would say... And, 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 and by doing it that way, by saying whatever you'd like to do, the guy will genuinely, genuine, generally, uh, generally show you respect by saying, all right, well, is there anything you'd like to get in? And this, this, is how a business, this is how the business used to work. It's amazing to me what's changed, but... And many of the changes in the business I like. This is one of the ones I hate. If you were the fucking job guy, Gabe, and you came out, if, if you were the star and I was a job guy, I'd go, hey, listen, Gabe, um, listen, I'm working with you tonight. Is there... Is there um, Anything you want to do, you know, whatever you want to do, it's cool with me. Whatever you want to do, just uh, let me know. And whenever you want to go over it, which is another key, whenever you want to go over because it, it's on you. You're the star. You've earned that. And then when, when I become the star, I'll earn that. And the guy who's talking to me, when he becomes a star, he'll earn that. It's just, it's not, it's, called, it's part of paying your dues, but it's also, you know, there's a reason why at a job, you know, there's a reason why officers are called sir. There's a reason why at a job somebody's higher up and somebody does a secretary. I mean, that's just the way the hierarchy, things have to be in a hierarchy unless you're a communist and then everybody's equal. And obviously communism doesn't work. So we're going to go our way with the hierarchy. So whatever you want to do and then uh, whenever you'd like to talk about it. And then generally the guy will say, well, is there anything you'd like to get in? And I'll say, well, I'd like to get this in if that's possible. And they're like, well, I don't know about that because I don't want to take that. Well, what about this? Mm, I don't think so. How about that? Okay, you could miss that off the top. And, and still you'd be like, all right, cool, I'll miss that off the top. And you'd be happy that you fucking get to miss something off the top. You know, I remember when I was fucking um, WCW, I was the cruiserweight champion. And I was working Steamboat in a TV match. Well, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think I was the champion that we, you know, that at that exact time. But you know, I was already been the TV champion, so and I already had a little bit of a push, right? And um, I was working Steamboat, and I was like, hey, and I was like, listen, I'd like to do this, this, and this. And he goes, I don't think so. He goes, you know, and basically, in so many words, very politely, he said, look, basically, I'm a star. You're on your way up. I don't think my character would that would that would look good if your character did that to my character. 
I was like, all right, I get that. I totally respect that. I mean, that's how it works. I mean, if everybody's even, then there are no stars anyway. There's always going to be somebody who's better than somebody else, and somebody who's better than that, and better than that, and better than that. And unfortunately, when you're green, you're down here at the bottom, and you're going to have to work your way up to the top, you know? And everybody wants to take a shortcut to the top, except they don't take the right shortcuts. You know, if you want to take a shortcut, it isn't even a shortcut, but if you want to get there faster, get some charisma, watch the last tape where he talked about being a star, because that'll get you faster than anything, way faster than work rate, or technical work rate. Um, but, uh, and I remember, because it was something, I think it was after the, uh, I think it was something where he goes for a finish, or he has something like his, there, there was going to be like a false finish or two, which back then, not every match, you know, every match now has 35, uh, and see, they're not even false finishes, which I'll write that down, I want to get back to that, because they're not even false finishes, but attempted false finishes, two counts is what they are, and, um, and then, uh, he basically, in so many words, said, uh, your character, basically, in so many words, said, your character isn't good enough to get that far with my character. He's right. I mean, fuck, his character been world champion. I, even though I, would, I was cruiserweight champion and I was starting to build a little following and stuff, I, you know, it's a Ricky Steamboat. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, today, you say that to a guy, they're like, you know, they'll, to your face, they'll, they'll be like, ah, fuck you. You know what I mean? Fuck you. You know, pay your fucking dues, you know? It, it's like these guys think it's like, um, you know, people have seen Raven on TV for on national TV. I've been on TV every week for 17 years. But you've been on national TV for like the last eight to ten, you know, and this guy's never been on national TV. Do you really think they're going to buy you fucking getting the better of the Raven character? I mean, it doesn't, and, and it's not, yeah, it's not my ego, because I could care less. I'll put over, like the other night I was going to Mike, I go, you know what we should do? We should put over these, this one kid was like his third match in the tag match. I was like, we should put the kid over just to fucking, you know, I, I said, I should let the kid pin me. And Mikey goes, I already did that last week. I already let him pin me. I was like, ah, forget it then. But I was going to have to, you know, I was going to, if it wouldn't have, irritated the fans, which it probably would have pissed them off because they don't want to see an upset like that, especially when you're a baby face. I mean, which, that, that's another thing I want to talk about is, uh, is um, why a lot of times stars have to go over in matches on indie shows. That's a whole other point. I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, they, they would have crapped all over if he pinned me. But I was more than willing to let the kid pin me. I just thought it would be entertaining. You know what I mean? Kids only had three matches. It was his third match or his fourth match in his entire life. You know? Um, it just it would be bad for the for the house. It would be bad for the fans. It's the only reason I didn't do it, um, which I'll come back to. But so it has nothing to do with that. I mean, it's just you know you earn a certain place of respect, and then these guys today don't have the respect. They don't think they think because they've been on indie shows for three, four years now, or seven years maybe. Hey, if there's a reason you've been on indie shows for seven years. Though. I mean, stop and take a look. You know, if you've been on indie shows for seven years and you haven't made it to the show yet. Maybe there's a fucking reason. Maybe you're not as good as you think you are. Maybe there's a reason that you don't have the star power or the skills or whatever it takes to be a money player, and that's why you're still in the indies after all these fucking years. You know, nobody wants to look at their own, you know, in their own backyard for the problem. Um, One thing I want to just say real quick, because Vordell got kind of buried, is Vordell is a good guy. Yeah. And um, it, I think it went well, no, 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 I, I kept the thing, because somebody showed this to me, and I kept it, and this is what pissed me off. This is the whole thing that, that set me off. I gotta read this fucking thing. Uh, Vordell, I mean, he, I, he struck me as a good guy that day with a complete lack of respect. He he, um, he, he might have been intimidated, and the big lesson there is, is not to be intimidated. Well, no, 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 but that, 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 no, that, 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 before the show, okay, he made a mistake, but after the yeah. show, I'm trying to explain to him that it was his job to go talk to Rick a second time then, and he, he was having none of it. And that infuriated me, but the part that really set me off was, who's this at? Uh... You should have highlighted it for me, Gabe. Hold on, let me find it. The, um, yeah, this is uh, somewhere over here. Basically, it says, um, he goes, he says, uh, he said, Walker wrote this on his website about Steiner. You are what makes this business look bad. I've heard about your rep for trying to be a bully to the young guys that you wrestle. I hope you, I hope you learned a lesson from this shoot. Not every young guy is a pushover, and you found that out this Saturday. Your shoot attempt on me has now submitted me as a legit shooter. You tried to stretch me. What you did was made me. People know now know I'm real because of the incident. Uh, I never wanted to be like you when I became a grizzled vet. I looked up to you as a kid for blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's not the case. I look up to you now as a washed-up All-American with a bad attitude. They got his ass handed to, to him by me. Uh, what really pissed me off with the matches is when you follow me in the bath and you act like nothing ever happened. Um, let's see. 
You see, I really don't like hurting people, but I will when put in a situation like the one I was on Sunday. If the shoe would have ended up with me getting my ass kicked, Steiner would be with However, Rick, I'm not a poop stain like you, and I don't have to beat on you until you were out. I did just enough to embarrass you. Um, which, as you saw, Gabe, that didn't happen at all. Yeah, there was no asses being handed. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't even anything remotely like that. And just to me, it's like, where he... Steiner, I believe Steiner went a little too far. You know what I mean? He, but but I, from Steiner's point of view, Steiner's fucking punched the guy five, six times, and the guy won't go down and won't sell it. Now, the guy won't even, was he even snapping his head back? I didn't see the, the initial punches. I just right. fast-forwarded right to the third. Right. And so, I mean, you know, that's what happened in the old days. That's how we were brought up. If the guy doesn't sell for you, you make him sell. That's just the way the business is. And, and the part that infuriated me about the Vordell, because before that I thought he was a nice guy, is, you know, he, is that he still didn't get how it was his job to come find Rick. It's his job to sell for Rick. I mean, all these things were brought upon because of his mistakes, and he's throwing it all on Rick. You know what I mean? And that just, you know, I don't know. That just, uh, whatever. I mean, uh, here's the thing. You know, he may be a very nice guy. He may be completely, and he may be legitimately the baddest guy on the planet. But he wasn't that day, and to write about it, he wasn't because he didn't do anything to Rick. But, I mean... And that's what I'm trying to defend Rick. I'm just trying to make a very specific point here about respect. And the problem is, is young guys today have no respect for their old timers. I mean, I feel like an old guy saying this, but I mean, when I got into business, I had so much respect. I mean, you know, it's like I look forward to working with these old veterans and learning from them. Nowadays, you try and teach somebody something, oh, they know it all. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how many guys, like Terry Taylor, be like, I, I tried to tell them. And the guy's like, ah, no, I'll do it this way. I know, like, I know better. Like, I was trying to help Tracy the other day. Uh, Tra I love Tracy. Uh, Tracy, um, Tracy Brooks. Love Tracy Brooks. We're an indie show in West Virginia. And she was going to do a bunch of this stuff, right? I'm like, Tracy, why don't you before the match go sing the Canadian National Anthem? You know, you're, you're, you're hailing from Canada. Why don't you sing the Canadian National Anthem? We're in West Virginia. It will so piss off the people. You'll get so much heat. She goes, I don't want to say. I go, I go just, uh, I'm trying to talk her into doing it because I know it's going to get heat. And she's like, I don't know the words. I go, it's even better. If you butcher it and mangle it, it's even better. And she was having none of it. She thought, we want to do this. And they were going to do this spot where, where she's wearing her sweatshirt out. And so then uh, Lollipop, and so Lollipop chops her, but it doesn't really hurt her because she's got a sweatshirt on. And then Lollipop pulls her sweatshirt off and chops her, and now it hurts. And they were making this big production. I gave them some ideas to make it a bigger production. Well, they go out there. Tracy has its thing. She chops her with the thing on. It doesn't sell. The lollipop pulls it off, chops her, and they roll right back into the ring and act like nothing happened. And, and the, the whole thing made no sense. I'm like, Tracy, I go, did you ever explain to the people why you're wearing your shirt? I go, and yeah, because I remember, I remember, um, that's Shane, uh, X Pac, uh, Sean Waltman going, why the fuck is she wearing a sweatshirt out there? She told me before she's going to wear a sweatshirt because she doesn't think these West Virginia fans deserve to see her body, and that way she, when she gets chopped, she can use it for a spot. I was like, Tracy, did you ever explain this to the fans? No. I go, so how the fuck they know? So to them, you're just wearing a sweatshirt for no fucking reason, right? Yeah. I go, why didn't you do the Canadian National Anthem? I, I didn't want to. I go, why? Well, I don't know. I go, Tracy, and I, and I love Tracy, but she's wrong. When someone, a veteran's trying to help you, you don't go, ah, I don't feel like doing it. You fucking do it. You listen. And if they're wrong, they'll say, ah, I fucked it up. You know, I'm trying to teach her, trying to help her, but she knew better. And in her way, it was so fucking rotten. I mean, the match stunk. I mean, they stunk the joint out. Um, it, may, it took me 20 minutes to explain to them after the match. And then she comes to me for advice because she wants me to tell what she did wrong. And I'm like, well, you should have listened to me. I go, why are you coming to me? I, what I don't get is why are you coming to me afterwards for advice? Well, I'm trying to give you advice before the match to help you. You don't want that advice. But then you want the advice where you fucked up. You know, I'm giving you ideas, and I'm not trying to, you know, and then I say, okay, if you don't want to do the Canadian National, that's fine. But let me help you with your spot. So, you know, if this is what you want to do, and you're set on doing it, then let me help you make it better. Well, they knew that. Oh, we know how to do it. You know, and to me, it's like, what the fuck then? Well, if you know how to do it, how come you couldn't do it then? How come you, you fucked it up so bad that no one, not even not even Sean Wallman, who's probably seen more wrestling footage than anybody on the planet, had any idea what the fuck you were doing? I mean, if anybody's going to be able to figure it out, it's he, he is. And I, and I love Tracy and Lollipop, you know what I mean? So I don't mean to pick on them, I'm just trying to illustrate a point. You know, people are trying to, every, everybody thinks they fucking know it all. Like, I used to, that was one of the things is, I've always been no, considered a know-it-all, but, you know, except that when it comes to wrestling, I always, I, I, I never, I never ever didn't listen to the old timers. Well, I used to get heat was I would ask them why. Which is actually the right question. I want people to ask me why. Like Al Madrill, I used to, I used to uh, Al Madrill was like the crotchetiest, miserable old bastard, but I, but I loved him. And Al Madrill, 
He, um, like, Puerto was a great territory because you worked 15, 20 minutes a night in a singles match. You fucking worked six nights a week, sometimes seven. And so you got to learn how to work. And it was, it was for people either coming up or going down in their career. So there's all these veterans with all these young guys so you could really learn and pick their brain. And so I would pick Al Madrill's brain, and he would tell me this, this, and this. And I'm like, all right, why? Ah, you snot-nosed punk, you do why? Because I tell you, I go, no, I don't mean it that way, Al. I'm not saying you're wrong, because I absolutely believe you're right. I'm asking you why, so I'll understand why I'm doing it. It's kind of the old, uh, buy me a, teach me how to, buy me fish, and I'll eat one day. Teach me how to fish, and I'll eat for a year. So if you, if you tell me to do it, okay, that's fine. But if I know why I'm doing it, then, because not everything applies every single time. So if I know why I'm doing it, now I can apply it, you know, when it applies, and apply it when it doesn't, you know, not apply it when it doesn't. And Al would get infuriated because he thought I was questioning his... So, I mean, so in that way, sometimes, yes, I would get a bad reputation as a know-it-all, except I didn't mean it that way, and I would always explain it to him, but back then, here's the difference. Back then, you weren't given a chance to explain anything, and even when you did, nobody listened to you anyway because there was such a, a delineation between veterans and greenhorns. Now, fucking... Now, the, the, never in the business ever have veterans been more accessible to greenhorns than today, and never in the history of the business have greenhorns asked and learned less than now. Back in the old days, everybody could work. I mean, everybody, the opening match guys could work. Now, 90% of the guys in the business can't work a lick. They may be able to do great high spots, but they can't work a match. They can't involve the people. You know, so they're missing the whole point of it. It's about drawing money, not about having a, um, not about masturbating and fucking and having a great 15, 25, 15 to 25 minute scientific, you know, high spot match. Boom, 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 boom. And the people are like, all right, who's on next? You know, and so, you know, back then, fucking, you know, people, back then it was hard to get veterans to teach you. They didn't want to teach you because they were afraid you'd take your spot. Now, you have more veterans that want to teach and more green guys that think they know it all. You know, it's, it's confounding. It's exasperating. It's annoying. And it's so stupid. Because how do, uh, it just, how do you not want to learn? I mean, and here's the thing is, like, like the part with the Tracy thing that really blows my mind is me and Tracy are really good friends. And, and so, okay, maybe she doesn't want to do the Canadian National Anthem, which where she's wrong is I know the market. I know the audience. I know what works, what doesn't. So I'm giving her an example from, some, from, from years and years and years of knowledge. Okay, and she didn't want to do it because she didn't want to look stupid. Which infuriates me because that's part of your job. That we talked about looking stupid before. Was that yeah, on the we talked about the last tape. We talked about looking stupid. The last tape we talked about looking stupid. I thought that was in the last tape, and um, I know I talked about it somewhere. You have to be willing to look stupid. And here's the thing: she's willing to look stupid in some ways, just not certain other ways. Like it's, if I, if you saw the last tape about a snotty the body thing, you know, I had to look stupid picking my nose. You know what I mean? I was, I was just to refresh anybody's memory who didn't see the last tape. Um, I wrestled a Scotty the body when I first got to Portland. Piper gave me three weeks to get over, and he made me a color commentator as well as a, as a guy on the show. And um, he said, all right, you call yourself Scotty the Body. We'll have you pick your nose in the first episode as soon as we come on the air and so we can call you Snotty the Body to get that fan interaction with you right off the bat. I, I didn't want to do it, but I trusted Piper's judgment. I mean, I also didn't want to get fired, but I mean, I trusted Piper's judgment and that he was right. I stuck my finger up my nose. People started calling me Snotty the Body. It got over instantly. got me instant. Like, I leapfrogged so many guys just with that stupid call and response. You know, she shut up. Snotty, Snotty, shut up. You know, with that just stupid... All I had to do was go like this, and the place would make more noise. Um, and then eventually I made 8x10s of me picking my nose, and had the baby faces sell them, and I made a fortune, you know, because the fans would bring them up to the ring, ah, look at you, picking your nose, they'd show them to me, I'm like, oh, you son of a bitch, I'll get you. And of course, I was making all the money. So, the whole thing is, is, um, I got lost on my side track. The uh, snotty the body, the looking uh, stupid, the Tracy. Yeah, yeah, so it's looking stupid. So yeah, so even if you don't want to look stupid, hey, look. And I'll tell you the biggest point of all: Vince McMahon was a billionaire at the time, a billionaire. He owned the company, and yet when when Steve Austin pulled the cat gun and said "bang," he peed his pants. There is nothing more humiliating than peeing your pants out of fear. And if a billionaire who owns the company can do it, well, how the fuck can you not be willing to look stupid yourself? I mean, that's just fucking arrogance, you know. And that's where Vince really earned my respect, believe it or not. That's how he earned my respect more than ever because I'm like, you know what? He's not asking anybody to do anything he wouldn't do himself. I mean, that's got to be, oh, you pee your pants? You know, and so Tracy, 
didn't want to sing it because you didn't want to look stupid. And, uh, okay, maybe you don't want to do it, but you should trust my judgment. Okay, but let's say, for whatever reason, that you just, uh, the dead set against it. Now I'm trying to help you with your spots to improve them, and you don't want to take my advice? Yet you want to come to me afterwards and tell you what you did wrong. You didn't fucking listen. I mean, is that fucking simple? You know, I can't make it, and I, and I love Tracy to death, and I love Lollipop, but it's just a simple case of arrogance and fucking, and a lack of respect. You know, there's a reason why, you know, when I started, the odds of me making it, as Gabe will tell you, were so slim and astronomical. I mean, how, what were the odds? Fucking a thousand to one? I mean, I was, I was one of the smallest guys in the business at 220, you know, um... There was fucking, there was only like three, ter four territories left, or no, maybe like five or six, and three of them shut down within my first six months. And it was like, there was Memphis, Puerto Rico, and Portland, and because uh, Continental and Kansas City shut down, and there was New York and WCW, and then, back then you didn't get to be, you didn't get to uh, AWA too. AWA you couldn't get in unless you were from Minneapolis, basically. Uh, WWE unless you were 300 pounds, and WCW unless you'd been in the business for five or ten years and you were a hell of a worker. And I was small to begin with, you know, a skinny Jewish kid, there, there, was, there was no chance to me making it, you know, and if I'd certainly, if I wouldn't have listened to anybody, I definitely wouldn't have made it, but, you know, it's just, I, I just, you know, I wanted to soak up all the knowledge I could, I used to ride with the booker, and I used to, you know, it's like nowadays, guys don't want to drive, they're like, ah, fuck, I gotta drive, oh, fuck, I used to drive the booker everywhere, the booker, I was a new guy, luckily, the booker picked me to ride with him, you know, of course, I had to drive, but I didn't care, because I was riding with the booker, which meant I got to pick his brain and get all the knowledge, and that, that was the grappling Lynn Denton, and I got so much knowledge, I used, to, I used to love this. And I would always have to drive. I was like, ah, fuck, Lenny, why do I got to drive? He's like, ah, because you're green, kid. You know, and he said, hey, look, I did the same when I was your age. I was like, yeah, he's right. You know, and so it's no big deal. But the best part was that I, I go, hey, listen, Lenny, I'm getting tired. He goes, listen, if you get tired, put my mask on, let the grappler drive. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, but so I used to ride with him and fucking, that, that's how I fucking learned. I mean, you know, nowadays, yeah, and back then, everybody talked about it, the whole show in the car. I mean, all you did was talk wrestling the entire drive. You know, now nobody t drives together, nobody talks together, nobody discusses the matches. Um, but, uh, you know, it's like, you know, like I used to always make Stevie drive. You know, and eventually he got the whole point of it. You know, like I always have Stevie drive. And he understood that he was the greenhorn and he was going to ride. If he was going to drive with a veteran, he had to drive, you know. When, um, I'll give you a better example. This is how far respect goes. Whether whether you're gone to a show or not, I mean, if you're with veterans, like whenever I'm with Terry Taylor, I always offer him the front seat. He never gives it to, him, never takes it because he doesn't. He lets let me have it because, oh, excuse me. Um, but whenever I'm with anybody, like I'll give you another example. I was, um, but me and Terry are really close friends, so he knows I like to sit in the front, so he lets me. But I'll give you a better example. The same thing. I was at an indie show about a month or two ago. It was me and Lawler. And somebody, and so this, they had some rat pick me up and drive me to the show. And then uh, she was driving me back, so Lawler needed a ride too, so Lawler was going to ride back with us. And, uh, and so um, I go, so, you know, because I rode up in the front seat and, and Lawler was just going to give me the front seat because I, I rode with her first. I was like, no, Lawler, you take the front. You know, and I've been in the business long enough now, 17 years, that I really don't have to give up the front seat. But I was like, this is fucking Lawler who's been in the business for... 30, 35 years? You know, absolutely. And I, and I hate back seats for two reasons. One is, I got three herniated discs in my back, which is why I don't sit on the Ring of Honor couch. She showed a Ring of Honor couch. Because it's so mushy, it fucks my lower back up. I herniated three discs, and they compress on my spine, which is why half the time you see me sitting really upright, and the other time I, I never sit in one place. That's also part of my ADD, but I have to keep moving my back. And the back seats are always... The seats are always at that weird angle where I'm really compressing my lower spine. And also, because of neck injuries from years of business, if I'm in a back seat and I got a crappy driver, I get sick real easy. You know, and I don't feel like, I don't feel like getting, you know, headaches and stuff. So, you know, I get back seat fucking headaches. So, I, I like sitting in the front, but, you know, Lawler's been in business 35 years. I don't have to give Lawler up the front seat for at this point in my career. But I still do, just out of respect. And it, and I and I want to go from the front seat out of respect. You know, it's um it's just part of the business. I mean, you know, if you don't understand respect by now, it's kind of hard to explain it. But that that's one of the things you always offer the front seat. You always offer to drive. Um, you always go find your opponent. You you know, um, you always ask him what he wants to do. You always go shake hands with everybody in the locker room. You walk around and shake everybody's hand and say, I'm an, and, and you introduce yourself and say your name. Um, one of the things 
Here's a point, just this is a really tough point, and this is one of the few things I'll, it doesn't bother me, but I mean, it does, but it doesn't. Okay, a lot of times, like if I'm in a conversation, or anybody, just say, but I'm just picking myself, but if anybody, like, if, let's say, um, Gabe's in a conversation. Well, Gabe's actually not a good example because he's a behind-the-scenes guy. Let's say uh, Terry Taylor's in a conversation, and you've never, and you're in a locker room at an indie show, and you walk in, and he's talking to somebody, and you shake hands with everybody else. Doesn't matter if he's in a conversation. I know this is weird because this is, goes against every other law of nature, but even if he's in a conversation, just say, "Excuse me for one sec. Just want to say I'm Raven," and then go back and sit down. Which I know you're thinking, "Why I, should I interrupt him?" Yes, you should. I know that sounds fucked up. That's the only. That's the only part of this that maybe no one should be able to figure out on their own, but you should interrupt them. Because you're not interrupting, and now if you start a conversation, yes, you're in the wrong. But if you just walk up, because you've walked up to everybody else, now you've left him out, um, just want to say, just want to say, excuse me one sec, just want to say hi, my name's Joe Blow, thank you. And sneak away as fast as you can. And that way they're like, wow, that, that's fucking respect. It's not interrupting a conversation. It's just showing respect. Unless it's something heated or something dead serious, you know, there, there are limits to it. But I mean, you know, if you have half a brain, you can figure out whether it's a dead serious conversation a money situation or just basically two guys bullshitting you know what I mean I'll give you a great example of uh, respect and how it can ruin a career um, Mike Sanders was in uh, WCW went to the power plant uh, became the head of the Natural Born Thrillers, um, became the commissioner of WCW blah 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 and that's a little career going for him WCW goes out of business uh, most of the guys got let go they hired Sanders in the HWA I was in WWF becoming a jabroni, and that that no one oh the Hugh Morris Albert story. Make sure you write that. Let me write airplane story. Um, I mean it's not Hugh Morris Albert. I mean oh, Hugh Morris Albert Christian story. Um, anyway the. Uh, so, so they sent me to HWA because they're, they're going to pay me. and They're not going to use me. They, they want to at least get some money out of me. Or get some use out of me. I mean so they sent me to HWA, and so they go um. They go, all right, we need you to uh, you get down there and help teach the school. So it was either, so now everybody's running, there's no booker, because uh, D-Lo was booking, I guess, and then he didn't show up again or something. So they're like, we need a booker. And I didn't feel like being a booker, but then when I found out I was going to have to run drills, I'm thinking, are you fucking kidding me? I've been in business 15 years, I'm going to have to start taking bumps again? And this is something, this is another reason why, all right, we me to come back to this story, because this other, I have to do a tangent here, too. Um, was I talking about... Uh, Oh, wait. You only have, like, you only, okay, I talked about wrestling schools. I was talking about that earlier, right? Yeah. Okay, in wrestling schools, the, um, another reason why you don't want to go to wrestling school for 10 years is because you only have so many bumps. Everybody only has so many bumps in their bump card, their career bump card. Uh, except for Terry Funk and Ric Flair, who have an unlimited number for some reason. And actually, Funk's starting to run to the end of his limit. Um, but Flair just has an unlimited number of bumps in his bump card. But everybody else, there's, you know, you can only take so many bumps, you know, in, your, in a career before your body really starts falling apart. No matter how much chiropractic, no matter how much, you know, painkillers or muscle relaxants or anti-inflammatories or massage or shiatsu or whatever it is you do. Um, and so, if you keep going, so that's why, like, uh, so if you keep going to wrestling, you know, if you keep going to wrestling school to practice bump after bump after bump, especially once you've gotten into the business, all you're doing is taking off the end of your career because your body can only take so much. Like the best example of that is Johnny Swinger, um, who's been in the business for 17, 16, 17 years, been full time probably six, maybe. But, you know, but been around a long, long time, and he's still only like 29 years old, which is unbelievable. He's only like 30 years old, and uh, so he. Uh, he quit TNA and signed a deal with New York, and New York sent him to the school in Atlanta, the new school. And uh, and now he's now he's taking bumps four days a week. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Swinger can already uh, work half the crew. They got him taking bumps all day long for four or five hours a day. I guarantee, if they keep this up, they're going to end his career because you, you can't take that many. You know, your body's not designed. I mean. He's not, no one's designed to take that many bumps, you know, because it, it's one thing to take bumps in a match with a crowd and the whole thing and adrenaline, and you still only take X amount, but to take bumps and bump drill for five hours a day with green guys who don't even know what they're doing, so you got a chance of injury, you know, that's just ridiculous, you know, that's why I used to go to Paige, I'm like, Paige, quit taking so many bumps at the school. If you're going to go to the school, because he used to go to school all the time, they work out new stuff, I go, work out stuff, but don't take the bumps, just work it out and then try it live. First of all, and they're like, I don't want to try it live, I don't want to up like I 
love to have it try it live and screw the spot up, but because when you hit it live the first time, the spontaneity is so much better. But back to doing drills and HWA was the HWA. So Mike Sanders. Back to Mike Sanders. So uh, Mike Sanders had um. He always had some heat, you know. There's been a lot of guys in this business, me, Razor, Shawn Michaels, um, a lot of heat magnets in the business, you know, solar panels, you know. And uh, Mike Sanders was one of them. Terry Taylor. You know, some people have a way that if there's a pile of shit, we can stick our foot in it no matter how it, you know, no matter where it is. And um, and Sanders was one of those. And um, so Sanders had heat. But Sanders is a good guy. Actually, Sanders has a nice little comedy career going, believe it or not. And I actually, like, uh, he actually has a sidebar. I seen him at an indie show, and I said, well, I, I really didn't think his, his stand-up act was going to be any good. I was like, well, tell me some of your stand-up act. And I thought I was going to have to pretend laugh. It's actually really good. I mean, I was actually surprised. It's pretty funny. Because me and, um, I think it was Swinger. I think me and Swinger were listening to him. We were cracking up. So anyway, so Sanders got some heat, and he's in HWA, and he's kind of uh, floundering there. And uh, so anyway, so I decided I can either take bumps with everybody else, which there's no fucking way I'm taking bumps after this many years in the business. And uh, so I'll be the booker. And that way I don't have to take any bumps. And th so they're like, all right, so you can book. So Because I wanted a booker, and they wanted me to book anyway, so I was like, oh, I'll book it. So I literally wrote six weeks of TV in like three hours. I mean, and it's good TV. I, and if I have the, I don't know if I have it somewhere, but I probably, I probably have it. No, I don't think I have it. But um, it's actually, I wrote some really clever TV. It, it didn't come off that way because, you know, it's one thing to write it. It's another thing to see it performed. But I wrote some really clever TV that I was quite proud of. And, um... And I'm usually not that, you know, stuff like that, I mean, you know, it really wasn't bad. It was really pretty decent TV. And, um, but it only took me a few hours. I mean, fuck, I've been studying this business my entire life, you know. My dad told me a long time ago, he goes, he goes, do this like you do, uh, like you would go, you know, like, you know, he wasn't the, wasn't the uh, most emotional guy in the world, you know what I mean? Like, I have so many complaints of my upbringing, but I mean, at this point, whatever, I've moved on. But one of the things he did say that made a lot of sense was, he goes, um, he said that, uh, study it like you would for a college exam, you know, because it's the same thing. If you're going to college, wrestling school is going to be the, you know, I already had a college degree, but, you know, which I actually didn't study at, but, you know, basically his whole point was, you know, don't take wrestling just like, hey, this is going to be fun, you know, I mean, enjoy it like that, but also work at it like it's, you know, like it means something, you know, so I always worked really hard. I want to be the best at it. And um, so I wrote the TV and, and they thought like, you know, I guess it took them hours and hours to write like one TV. I was like, Psh. All right, we'll do this storyline for this, that, 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 that. I mean, and, and to be honest, writing storylines is not that easy. And that's something else I want to talk about. I'll come back to that. But writing television, being a booker, oh, my God. It's so much more difficult than anybody realizes for most. And I'll explain why there's so many bad decisions. And there's a lot of stuff around that if, if we have time. That, that's a whole other thing. That's a whole other thing? Yeah. Oh, tough for you people. <laughs> anyway, so anyway, so I'm like, I need somebody that I need. So now I'm thinking, if I'm going to go in a room and write by myself, I need someone to hang out with. I was like, ah, right, me and Sanders get along pretty good. Sanders is pretty entertaining. All right, Sanders, you be my assistant booker. And I pulled him out of drills. And so he, me and him would go hang out, and I'd write the TVs. And he had a couple ideas he threw in, but mostly I wrote the shit. And then we would just hang out and bullshit for like three hours. And then I'd be like, and so I guess they had to run drills from like 10 to 2 or something, 10 to 3 or whatever the fuck it was. So after about two hours of uh, being in there, basically it involved me laying on the ground, uh, you know, with my briefcase as a pillow and my feet up on a chair and, sweat, and Sanders sitting back doodling in the fucking, you know, because he would write everything for me because he had neat penmanship. That was the other key, neat penmanship. He um, he was doodling. Um, I go, oh, you know what? I go, Les, because Les Thatcher was running. I go, Les, we, we just can't think anymore right now because it's a creative process. We, we need to go, we're going to go to Bob Evans and, th and think there. So we would go to Bob Evans and eat. <laughs> and basically, well, Stevie Richards and the Hugh Morris and all those guys are running like four or five hours of drills every day with the fucking students. Me and Sanders would spend two hours at the school, hour, hour, hour and a half. And then we'd go to Bob Evans and then I would go home and fucking take a nap. <laughs> and this went on for like a month. Anyway, but the thing was, is that maybe even longer or whatever. Anyway, but the thing was that, um, that, uh, so Santa started getting with the program and, and the, and he was, I mean, he was actually, you know, come up with some idea, but at least he, the office saw him interested in something, WWE office, and they're like, hey, wow, we're seeing a change in Sanders, you know what I mean? Because he had the, um, I guess he had malcontent written all over him and slacker. And yeah, because he wasn't motivated, you know, he's already, he's already been on TV, WCW, drawing huge, you know, part of huge ratings as a commissioner and, you know, 
and now he's got to go back to a school and take bumps. I mean, it, it is kind of fucked up. It's really fucked up. You know what I mean? And he really didn't need to learn how to take bumps. I mean, he wasn't a great worker, but it wasn't at a school that he needed to learn how to get better. It was in front of people, as we talked about before. So going to a school and taking and running drills and taking bumps is not necessary, and not necessary for a lot of the people there. And so now all of a sudden he's taking, you know, he's starting to work hard. They think, and you know what I mean, and. Uh, yeah, because it is hard to work at Bob Evans, and uh, even though we weren't actually working, we were just eating. But uh, the cinnamon hotcakes are phenomenal too. Oh, you no, get no, the cinnamon. No, no, we gotta switch tape. Oh, <laughs> um, I don't know what that means. Anyway, cinnamon hotcakes. So at Bob Evans, they have the best cinnamon fucking hotcakes on the planet. And then what you do, and actually they're the whole grain ones too. But the secret is, is instead of using syrup with it, you use honey. And you have to get the, uh, but the honey has to be heated. So you got to take them, tell them to unscrew the top, stick it under the heat lamp. You know, they keep the heat, the food heating, and then fucking bring it. And then I'm telling you, oh, it's the best. So I would, I, I love Bob Evans. I, I hate the fact, that's the one thing I hate about Georgia is there's no Bob Evans in Atlanta. But they do have Waffle House. Okay. Which, speaking of Waffle House, I have a Waffle House table in my kitchen. <laughs> um, you knew that. <laughs> and it's my prized possession. Actually, it's one of many. Um, and, and usually the highlight of any tour of my palatial estate. Anyway... Of stately Raven Manor. <laughs> anyway, the um, so uh, so I, I love eating the Bob Bob Evans hotcakes. They're just tremendous. The whole green ones with the honey. Just remember that. Anyway, so um, so we're hanging out there. So anyway, so after a while, Sanders, Sanders the officer, he starts getting over to the office, and Jim Ross is like, all right, Sanders is starting to apply himself. And then when I and I go, Sanders, you know, when I leave, you're going to have to be the booker. So he was still writing TVs, and he was working. He, he worked really hard, and he wrote some decent stuff. And he would call me every once in a while to you know to prick my brain so I would know what was going on. And he did really well, and he really started to thrive under the environment, right? Because by then I'd gone back to the uh, to the show, not the big show, because he was he would have eaten me anyway. But to the WWE show anyway. So the um the back to the show and um the uh so Sanders was really starting to thrive, and the office was really getting behind him. And here they, they saw this 180-degree turnaround. And Vince is big on stuff like that, like personal growth. Like, um, that was one of the things, when I, when I came in as Johnny Polo, um, and they put me, and I was Johnny Polo, and they made me a TV character, and they wouldn't let me wrestle because they said I was too small. And this is fucking, you know, 1992, you know. Imagine 84, how small, you know, how small must look when guys were even bigger. This is 92 when guys are already getting smaller. And, um... So they also made me a commentator, and then they, they uh, wrap around, I mean, wrap around segment, not a commentator, wrap around segments, and they made me a producer. I was, a, I was associate producer of Raw, and uh, so I started rubbing. You know, I mean, I think you know, I wasn't a corporate type, and then Vince started making me wear a tie to work and this and that. But then, but, but I really got over with him because he saw this 180 degree turnaround from you know, from Scott Levy, who's Raven, you know, to wearing a tie and a suit. Oh, I fucking hated it. Oh, I was a nightmare. And actually, what you really used to do was, I had um, I had an office in Titan Tower, like it was Pat, um, Bruce, okay, it was Linda McMahon, Bruce, Howard Finkel, Pat, and mine was right here across facing theirs, and then JJ and then Vince, and. Um, so I had all these charts on the wall and all these flow charts and stuff, you know, about different TVs, you know, because I was only writing the second run TVs. So they already, all the booking I wasn't doing, I was being groomed for that, but I was writing like All American and Mania, which were second run. So I had all my little charts on the wall so I could keep track of one week to the next week. And then so I basically every morning I'd call up the office and say, oh, I'll be in the studio. And I'd call up the studio and say, I'd be in the office. And then I'd just go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and if it was like a 60, 70 hour week job, it would take me 16 hours. And eight of it was spent, because um, I came up with an idea for an All-American to show like a nostalgia match and like an old school match just because I wanted to look I, I just basically wanted to watch old tapes <laughs> so <laughs> but also I knew people would enjoy it but I wanted to, so I would basically go sit in the studio and watch old tapes of like George the Animal Steel and stuff and then the, the fucked up thing was I couldn't use half the footage I found because so and so was working for WCW or they left on bad terms or whatever so there was like very few guys and then you gotta have a name guy versus a name guy so yeah but I got to watch like um, Dusty and uh, Superstar Billy Graham at the fucking at the uh at Madison Square Garden, their one appearance, you know what I mean? Well, that basically was a stall fest, but you know, it's great seeing so you know, Billy Graham and all his tie dye glory and Dusty with the robes, because Dusty used to wear robes and everything. Anyway, the um, so basically eight hours were spent watching matches, eight hours were spent, and then the other 44 hours was spent sleeping <laughs> and then getting drunk at night with Shane McMahon, which really pissed off Vince. And I think that's what screwed me when I went back the second time. Was uh, yeah, you see, the, the, the worst part is this is a nice little sidebar, but the worst part is, is the um, me and Shane McMahon hit it off really well. And Shane used to always say, Me and you are going to be the Patton Bruce of the 90s, you know what I mean? And uh, which neither thing even remotely happened, but um. 
you know, but every night, me and Shane, I mean, I mean we just got along, we just really clicked. And I, used to, I was actually an original member of the Mean Street Posse, because I was actually his real life friends. And I used to be one of, you know, because I used to hang out with, with Billy and uh, fucking. Uh, I can't remember the name. I'm bad with names. But anyway, we still hang out together. So I'm like, when they debuted the Main Street Posse, I'm like, ah, I'm actually a member. Okay. But, um, so, and then the, yeah, every night he'd call, and I used to call Vince Vic on TV when I was commentating. <laughs> ah, listen, Vic. And so he would call his dad every night. Go, hey, listen, Vic, I'm sleeping at Johnny Polo's tonight. I'll be home tomorrow. You can't take the boss's kid out and get drunk. And the worst part was I got heat with the boys because they thought I was sucking up to the boss's kid. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm burying myself. You know, I, if I was any, if I had any brains, I wouldn't hang out with the kid at all, and it would have helped my career. But it killed my career hanging out with the kid. But anyway, but then I started wearing a tie because Vince made me, and then so then he thought I was, you know, becoming less me and more what he wanted to be. So he was like really impressed, and that's when I quit. And um, because I wanted to be Raven and be what, do what I want to do, and that's a whole other chapter. But anyway, so Sanders is really getting over now. So Sanders is getting over, getting over, getting over. The office loves him. They love him. Fuck, we got plans for this kid. You know, we're grooming him. You know what I mean? And then, uh, so I'm back at WWE, and finally we're doing a TV taping in Atlanta or Cincinnati where Smokey or I mean HWA is. I can't remember. I think it was in Atlanta though. Yeah, it actually, was Atlanta. And so, um, so the so Sanders was there because that's his hometown, and. Uh, we're sitting at a table, and uh, let me see if I, I got to remember this exactly right. Oh, yeah, Hunter had blown out his quad, I think, then. So he's on crutches. And um, maybe I think that's what I was trying, but I know he was on crutches. And so Sanders, uh, let me think for a sec. Did Hunter walk up? I guess Sanders walks around says hi to everybody, except I think Jericho. <laughs> but even worse, Hunter walks up on crutches, right? Sanders doesn't fucking introduce himself. <laughs> so Hunter is on crutches. He's like, I'm a, I'm a Paul, I'm Hunter Hurst Thompson. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and Sanders' career ended that day. <laughs> and, and to be honest, I mean, you know, here, he's the guy who's the, basically being built as the franchise. You know, he wasn't uh, not Shane Douglas or Gilbert Parole, who was actually originally known as the franchise for the Buffalo Sabres in hockey. A little piece of trivia. Because actually, I know everything about sports pre-1976 before I stopped playing <laughs> sports. I hated sports after that. I liked unorganized. See, I didn't like organized sports. I liked unorganized sports like roller derby, <laughs> wrestling, survival of the fittest, which was like a nature version of the you know, world's toughest man, strongest man, whatever. Yeah, I liked uh, disorganized sports. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but pre-76, before I moved uh, out of Philadelphia, I knew everything about sports. But anyway, so, um, you know, Shane's, I mean, so, Hunter Hurst Helms, he's the uh, top guy. He's fucking on crutch. You know, and out of respect, you're supposed to introduce. And Sanders goes, I, I go, what the fuck are you doing? Like afterwards, I pull him aside. He's like, I, he goes, I don't know. He goes, I just, I saw him. He was talking to somebody. I didn't want to interrupt. Next thing you know, he's walking over to me. I was like, ugh, you signed your death warrant. And, and it was. I mean, he was done. I mean, basically. All the progress he had made, turning around, becoming an HWA booker, first the assistant booker, then the booker, showing, I mean, because the other reason I made him the booker in HWA was you needed a guy who, was gonna, who wasn't afraid to tell people, listen, this is what you're doing, you're putting him over, and that's what, you know, because nobody wants to put anybody, which, which back then is, you didn't even question anything back in the old days, so I'll get back into that respect, it all ties together like a Seinfeld episode, <laughs> and, um, but, uh, and, and, and I mean, and it killed him off, which I'm not saying is, I'm not saying that's fair, but that's to the extent how much respect is revered in this business. And um, the, uh, or what was the thing I just, my little sideboard that I just made, the, um, I was still on the Seinfeld episode. Yeah, I'm saying, but what did I say right before the Seinfeld episode? They said the, uh, oh, that, that was it for Sanders. Right, but right after that, the, uh, right. he was making progress, he was make, assistant make, booker, booker. Yeah, making assistant booker, you are writing the thing, and then, and then it ended that quickly, and fucking, uh, and, um, and that's how revered respect is in this business. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. It's, it's almost like there's an echo in here. The, <laughs> the um, yeah, I, I go off on so many tangents in my head that I forget which one I'm talking about. Um, it's all part of the ADD, which is actually ADHD, but I'm too lazy to go ahead and say ADHD. <laughs> One time, actually, before I actually was diagnosed with ADD, because uh, I was never diagnosed as a kid with ADD, because I could always focus. And one of the things they thought was, if you could focus, then you can't have ADD, because I could read for hours or whatever. And you know, if I'm on a movie, I don't, I don't get antsy or anything. And uh, 
So I never diagnosed, but I, I started to suspect that I still had it, though. So me and Lodi one day went to the library to go look up ADD, to read about it. We walked in, pulled a couple books off the shelf. I skimmed through them. After like five minutes, I got bored. I said, let's get out of here. And, and we're leaving. And we, when we walked in, we asked the lady where the ADD books were. And Lodi's like, do you know what you just did? He goes, you went to the library to read about ADD. After five minutes, you got bored and left. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> so anyway, so... Um, so uh, the um, yeah, so the Sanders thing. I'm not saying he should have been, that, that, you know, he shouldn't have been killed off for that. But I mean, but literally, it ended his career that day. And uh, the um, it just, I mean, respect is so important in this business. Ah, oh, fuck, I had a point. Oh, well, give me some of my points that I wanted to come back to. Uh, false finishes, the uh, humor. Oh, the humor. Yeah. Okay. Here's another example. That was one of the things I hated about when I went back to New York. Was um, I've been in a business. 14, 13 years at that point. I've been on top of every minor territory. Uh, I had a nice little push in the WCW. Um, ECW, I was the world champion. And uh, in WWE, because I was, I'd already, you know, I'd been a, a associate producer and, um, and a manager there. But when I get to WWE now, because I'm being used as a bottom guy, I start getting treated like a bottom guy, which is bullshit. You know, which is fucking bullshit because half the guys that were in the, were in the business then were all green guys. And so to them, well, I'm on the same level they, you know, I mean, I, I was below them on the card. And, you know, to me, it's like, I don't give a shit if, uh, if you know, if, let's say hypothetically that um, Arn Anderson, you know, not Arn Anderson, because me and them don't get along. Let's pick a guy. Let's say Terry Taylor. Let's say me and, me and Terry Taylor are in a territory and he's still working and he's an opening match and I'm the main event. I'm still going to be like, Terry, do you want to sit in the front seat? It doesn't make a difference whether he's opening match. His time and grade and what he's done is what warrants the respect, not his position on the card. And it fucking infuriated me that guys would treat me like, you know, like, you know, they, they, they would treat me like I, like, I, like I didn't like deserve it. And, and finally, um, and this is, this is one thing that I loved, and I loved about Hugh Morris for this. And, uh, and me and Christian were really good friends. But we were on a flight, stranded somewhere, and there was a, there was a first class seat upgrade available, and uh, and this pissed me off. Fucking Albert goes, I'm taking the first class seat, and I'm like, Albert, I said, you've been in business for fucking two years. Oh, I'm a big guy. That's not how it works. Not only that, but you should have enough respect to fucking offer it to me, and I'll give it back to you because of your size. But I'm fucking been in, you you've been in a business I, like like a hand job compared to fucking how long I've been in the goddamn business. You know what I mean? But all right, you know, whatever. So that, that slides only because of Albert's size, and Albert is 6'10", 300 pounds. So it is, a, it is a bit of a difference. You know what I mean? So it's a big difference with that. But then Christian goes, he tried to cock block me to get the seat. And Hugh Morris, I don't think he's ever forgiven him for it. Hugh Morris stood up, and I mean, it wasn't even Hugh, Hugh's seat. Hugh stands up and was like, this is fucking bullshit. He goes, Christian, that's fucking bullshit. He goes, Raven's been in the business of fucking 15 years, or the fuck I've been at that time. He goes, it's his fucking seat out of respect. That's the way this fucking business works. You know what I mean? And fucking, I mean, and Hugh was dead serious. And Hugh, I don't think, ever forgave Christian for that. Because it showed a complete lack of respect. And the worst part was, me and Christian were really good friends. We still are. But it just goes to show you... Because I was being used like a jobber, he's used here, and how how poorly respect is taught these days, that that was what happened, you know, and, and I got the seat anyway, you know what I mean, so then I ended up getting the seat, and then actually I was like, you know, fuck, Hugh should get the seat after me, because Hugh's been in second longest after me, you know what I mean, and then uh, by Hugh didn't, by then Hugh was just, he wanted to make a point, and I think, it's like the Billy Silverman shit, when, um, fucking, uh, but I think Silverman got big heat. I think how he originally got his heat, the referee, because he was sitting in a first-class seat, and he didn't even offer it to any of the veterans. I'm like, that's fucking bullshit. You don't take any fucking bumps. You're a buck forty. You know, the smallest of us is two thirty, two forty. You know, we take bumps for a living, and you're not going to offer us your first-class seat. That's fucking bull. And it used to infuriate me to tell you where that Terry Reynolds would sit in first class. She would always have upgrades, and the boys would be in the back, and she's 90 pounds. And she's like, well, I've been in the business. I'm like, you, you don't do anything in the business. I mean, that just, I mean, I love Terry, but that was bullshit. You know what I mean? And the only reason she got away with it was she was a girl, but Silverman didn't get away with it because, you know, it pissed people off. And that's why the boys have an inner code. That's why we have kangaroo court. We have inner policing because of shit like this. You know what I mean? Like, there's stuff that only we can, that applies to us, that only works within the context of us, and it has to be that way, you know, like any, any, you know, it's kind of like the military or anything else, you know what I mean, we have our own laws and culture that you have to respect, if you go to a Samoan or a tribal people, and their culture is to, um, you know, to fucking 
whatever, to, you know, to, to uh, be, be can like, not, not Samoans, but I'm saying, let's, let's say you go to some, uh, I, I got an example. Let's say you go to, like, some countries in, like, Arab, it's okay to, it's okay to fart, or you're supposed to fart after meals. But I don't know, I remember reading that, hearing that as a kid, but let's just say it's true, all right? If you don't, in our culture, if you fart at the table, it's fucking disgusting. But in some cultures, you're supposed to, you know, or like, you know, every culture has its own particular rules of society, and you have to follow those rules. Um, and and, and in um, Arab countries, if you steal, you get your hands chopped off. Well, that doesn't work here, but that's what that's the country. That's what it works, you know. So. We have our own little rules that apply to our culture, and you have to follow them. And respect is number one because you're giving your body to, and it all starts in the ring because you give your body to somebody else, and you respect them not to hurt you, and they respect you not to hurt them, and it applies all the way up and down across the board, bar none. It has to, you know, and you have to follow the rules. And and the thing is, is these fucking kids today, partly they don't know because they're being trained by guys that, that don't know fuck all. You know, even Larry Sharp didn't teach me the way that, what he should have. But of course, he wasn't ever there, so I can't blame him. And Charlie, it's not Charlie's. Charlie wasn't. He was a teacher. He wasn't. It wasn't his school. You know what I'm saying? He was just there to teach me the moves. You know what I mean? So it wasn't his place either. It was Larry's place, and Larry was never there to do it. Um, the uh, and then part of it is, is not just they don't know, but part of it is just that they fucking they think they know better, which is you know just exasperating because they don't. It's exasperating because if the ones who do make it, which are almost none of them, who have a successful career, are going to eventually be in the same position. They're going to be on these snot-nosed punks, and they're going to fucking see how it feels. But also, hey, let's say it, most of them aren't going to make it anyway. You know what I mean? I mean, the majority of people in this business are not going to make it anywhere. You know, I mean, I think they realize that. I think they know it's a, you know, and I guess... Well, especially now, there's only five top guys in the whole industry because there's only yeah. five top spots now. Well, I mean, in, in a sense... There, yeah, there was, I mean, there were so many more full-time people. Well, when I started, though, the full-time was running down. I mean, there was there was Puerto Rico, which is still there, Portland, which is gone, Memphis, which I guess finally gone, I guess, Continental, which shut down within six months, so they weren't there. Kansas City shut down within six months. Within actually, with actually Continental and actually Continental and Kansas shut shut down within a month or two. So I may have killed the business, but um, but the, and the AWA, which was on its last legs, and. Uh, WWE, which was running three shows a night, <laughs> three shows a night. Yeah. Now they run one show a night. They that drawn. Yeah. This was business on a booming when I started. I mean, I wasn't even booming. The boom was already over, but it was still way up there. But they hadn't started on the big slides. So I guess I actually you know who really killed the business was Rhino. Think about this. Rhino went to Germany and the, ter and the territory shut down. <laughs> then he joined ECW and fucking they gave him the TV belt and they lost TV. They gave him the world belt and the fucking company went out of business. Then he joined the WWE and joined the Alliance and the Alliance fucking got crushed. And then, uh, oh, I, actually, I talked to him the other day and he actually said that was the reason he quit. The, the, that's why the reason he, um, the WWE let him go was because he couldn't kill the territory. He was actually happy because he couldn't ter kill the territory. <laughs> actually, Rhino's a good friend of mine, which reminds me of a good uh, road story. That I can tell in a minute. Actually, I already told on a different DVD, but I'll tell on this one too. It's a different series about the Sandman ODing, and uh, uh, yeah, we we got yeah we, we covered got, that. Uh, yeah, right. we covered. Well, that. yeah, that was one of those. on uh, straight shooting with Raven and Sandman for all the people looking to buy it. Out and there. you can buy that from Gabe Sapolsky Video <laughs> at uh, Langhorn PA ROHWrestling.com. So right there. Yeah, there but, you go. Um, but um, yeah, I just you know it, it's amazing to me that um. How badly, how poorly respect is, uh, you know, is maintained, is treated. I mean, it's just, it's mind-boggling. And, and, and the, the part to me that I don't understand is why you wouldn't. Like, to me, I can't even imagine not offering, you know, Lawler the front seat or something as minor as that, just because I got so much respect for what he's done. You know, even guys I don't like, I'm going to show him respect. You know what I mean? Yep. It, it's just, it's, it's, I don't know, I mean... I just find it mind-boggling that these guys today, God, I feel like, you know, you sound like such a grandpa. These young kids today, get off my porch. Get off my lawn, you kids. But these fucking young kids, they just, they think they know it all. You know, I mean, I was branded as a guy who thought he knew it all, and yet I asked everybody for information. I fucking tried to pick everybody's brains, and I was branded a know-it-all. So imagine how these guys would be back then if they fucking won't listen to anybody. And, and, and I don't see... I don't see anybody be, like. Well, here's the part I don't get. I don't see anybody becoming a huge star. So it's like, okay, maybe. Now I'll give you an example. The Rock just got that big that quick, right? 
If anybody had the right to fucking, you know, to be like, you know, I think I know better, maybe it's him because he went from the most hated guy in the business as a baby face to the hottest heel in under a year. And yet he still was one of the most respectful guys, made sure he picked Patterson's brain for everything he did. Do you know what I mean? And if anybody had a right to fucking think they knew something, it was, you know, to know it all, it's him. I'm not saying he didn't because yeah, I think he's brilliant. You know what I mean? But it's just, you, man, you try and tell guys stuff. Eh, I don't want to do that. I know better. I don't. Uh, where's some of my other stuff? Oh, let me get uh, another great rib. One of my other favorite ribs, I never actually participated in it, but uh, my favorite rib story is. Uh, is uh, the Fargos used to do it down in Memphis. So uh, the Fargos, let's say the Jackie Fargo and uh, I guess uh, Sonny Fargo or whatever the guy's name was. So they would be driving down the road and they'd find a hitchhiker. So they pick the hitchhiker up, right? So they put the hitchhiker in the back seat. And then uh, they all of a sudden they start getting in an argument. Hey, fuck you, fuck you. Yeah, well, fuck you. Get out of the car. They got a car. Guy pulls out a gun with blanks. Bam! Shoots the other guy. <laughs> guy goes down. Get in the car. Get in the car. To the guy fucking who um, they picked the hitchhiker. And they fucking drive off. And so the guy's like, oh my god, we killed somebody. He's like, shut up, guy. You won't fucking say a word. I'll fucking kill you, too. <laughs> yeah, then, of course, like, then I guess what would happen is so one of the other boys would come pulling up, throw the other guy in the back seat. You know, then now the, guy's at the, now the, the guy and the hitchhiker at the bar, and they're like, oh my. And the guy's like, oh my god, oh my god. Of course, the other guy walks in. <laughs> I agree with that. How about if, uh, for a young guy that's getting ribbed, what's the best way to handle a rib? Take it like a man. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. That's another thing. You know, if you get ripped, you know, okay, I'll give you a real good example. Um, the uh, all right, if you're getting ribbed, okay, chances are people are ribbing you a because they like you, or b because you did something to piss off the general. Yeah, you know, like sometimes you rib your friends. You know what I mean? No but one really gets ribbed for no reason. At least yeah. I've never seen it. Yeah, but so basically, but basically, if you're getting ribbed, chances are you piss somebody off, and they're ribbing you to put you back in your place or whatever. Um, there's no because back in the old days, I mean, there were just ribs just for ribs' sake, you know. Um, and that just that was you know, but that that's pretty much gone now. So now if you if you get ribbed, it's pretty much there's a reason for it. I mean, if it's a serious rib, not just you know, whatever. And uh, so. Um, let me think of an example. Oh yes, I remember when I was in the, I was in WWE as Johnny Polo, and you know I, I have a tendency to be loud and obnoxious. I don't know if anybody noticed that. And this is before me and Bam Bam got along. Me and Bam Bam Bigelow ended up getting, we get along really well. But this is before that, and, and, and I'm pretty sure it was him. And somebody kept ribbing me every night, throwing my like I, whatever like one of those Johnny Polo whatever goofy hats I would wear. I guess I was in the road and they kept throwing it in the garbage every night. And I was fucking it up, right, or just ruining it, or it was disappearing, I guess, or something. And uh, so after about three, four nights, it got to the point where, you know, and me and Nash have been buddies for years. I'm like, Kevin, like, fuck, I, you know, at some point, somebody fucks with you enough, you either got to say something. Like, like, so here's the difference. And I don't even know if it was Bam Bam. So, and I got two instances. And so I don't even know if it was Bam Bam. And, uh... Yeah, and it may have been, but I mean, that's, that's who everybody told me it was or whatever. So, it finally got to the point where even though I knew Bam Bam would beat the fuck out of me, I was ready, to, if it happened again, I was going to be like, Bam Bam, look, if we have a problem, look, then we'll need to step outside. You know what I mean? I was willing to take my ass beaten like a man. Um, and thank God it never came to that. For whatever reason, whatever happened, it just stopped happening, and I never had to worry about it, which I was so happy for, thank God, because Bam Bam would have crushed me. But, but, I, but I had enough balls that I was like, yeah, if, if I got to do it, I got to do it. That's one example, and I'll and I give you another one. The, um, the, when I was in Portland, our bar was just a river. Back then, people just ribbed for no reason. Um, you know, people just liked to rib. You know, and, when I, and the short sleeve is a great rib. I'll tell you that one in a sec. Write that down. The, um, anyway, so somebody ribbed Billy Jack. And I, me and Billy Jack always got along really well because he had like a goofy sense of humor, too. And... Um, and so, uh, and Billy Jack was a big, tough, badass motherfucker, right? He's a boxer, and he was just a bodybuilder, and he, he was one of those guys, he looked phenomenal back in the day, back in Florida, back when I was growing up. And, uh, and Billy was being like, he was being really cold to me, so I knew something was up. I was like, fuck. You know, Billy's pissed at me for something. I, I knew I didn't do anything. And I had to go to the ring, and I was like, fuck. And I was like, man, I couldn't wait for, the, whatever I had to do in the ring, I couldn't even tell you, because I, all I knew was I wanted to get back to the locker room for as quick as I could and, and confront him. You know, and say, like, so, and, I, and, and, and at some point, I forgot Art Bard ribbed him and framed me for it. And that was just Art. Art was like, so, back in the day, people would just rib you. Like, now you're lucky. I mean, nobody just ribs you for no reason. And uh, so finally, if I can, this is another instance where I really lucked out and uh, so I pulled Bully aside when I got back from the ring I was like listen I go you know I don't know what you think but I didn't pull that rib I go and I, and I can't tell you 
who did because I'm not going to be a stooge either. You know, because that's another thing. You don't want to be a stooge. I was like, I'm not going to be a stooge, but I didn't do it. And look, I said, look, if you want to fight me, I said, then we'll fight. I said, you'll probably kill me, but I'll fight you because, you know, I'm not going to... I'm not going to back down and be a cunt, but I mean, you know, so he's like, and, and, he, and he knew I was being honest, and the fact that I had enough balls to go up to him and say, look, I'll fight you if we have to, and he didn't want to fight either, so I was like, Whew, thank God. You know, so like, you know, he, so he, and we totally ended up getting going right back to being friends, and he knew I didn't do it. Um, that kind of instance doesn't really happen. Like, I'll give you another example, same lines. Um, Bulldog Bob Brown in Kansas City ribbed Scott Hall, framed Marty Gennetti for it. Marty's sound asleep on the training table, and Hall just comes in and starts pounding the fuck out of him. <laughs> well, which really is it's funny, but it isn't, because Marty wasn't even awake to defend himself. And Marty's actually really tough. People don't even realize that. But I've actually seen Marty get behind Scott Steiner, like wrestling, and actually get behind him and stay behind him with Scott Steiner. And actually, or Rick, too. I don't, I don't know if he got behind I think Rick, maybe Rick, too, but definitely Scott. Anyway, um... And Scott was actually the All-American. Um, but, I mean, but, you know, Marty sound asleep, and here's this guy just starts pounding on him. You know, and Scott Hall is fucking, you know, back then he was 299. He never quite made 300 pounds, but he was 299. And, uh, yeah, he got, you know, and so that kind of shit doesn't happen anymore. So people are lucky. Because that shit just fucking, to me, I think that's just, just mean. You know what I mean? Just to fucking rib somebody, just to, you know, I think that's mean. Now if you get ribbed, there's a reason to it. And so, basically, if somebody ribs you, you should just take it. You just take it like a man, because basically the reason you get ribbed nowadays is because you don't, you're not fitting in with the system, and that's how you show that you can fit in with the system. Like if you can take it. And so the thing with the Bam Bam thing was was odd, because I guess I wasn't fitting in. But then it, I guess it's I guess it worked itself out. I don't even know if it was Bam Bam. You know what I mean? But. Now, if it keeps happening and happening and happening and happening, at some point you got to stand your ground. But you don't want to stand your ground the first time because that's not the way it's handled. You know, you don't like fuck you, motherfucker, who did this? Because if you do that, they're just going to keep ribbing you. I mean, that's the whole the whole point is to see if you can fit in with the system, if you can take a joke, and the joke's on you. And so if you if you get ribbed and you go fuck you, motherfucker, let's go. Well, they're going to keep ribbing you because you sold it. Yeah, so the key is you don't want to, but if you know sell it completely, now you're not putting them over for the, what they did to you, so that's, even, that, that's pretty bad too. So if you just act like nothing ever happened, that's pretty bad. You have to, uh, you, know, you have to be like, ah, fuck, you know, all right, you got me basically. You know what I mean? And you, you put it over, you, but you don't sell it like, god damn, fuck, shit. You don't want to sell it like a motherfucker, but you also don't want to no sell it like it never happened because both of them defeat the whole point. The whole point is you're not fitting in. You need to fit into the system or you can't take a joke or the joke being, you know, you can't take any humor at your own expense. And so they're giving you an opportunity. So what they're doing is putting you in that position. And if you pass the test, so to speak, then it's cool. You know, and basically, you know, that's also why they have kangaroo court in New York. Um... There, were, there was an episode when I was there where basically, uh, actually, you know what, I, I don't want to go into that because that's that shouldn't be anybody's business. Um, the uh, that would also break the rules of the business. Um, that particular instance, I think. Um, all right, uh, what do you think of the whole Lance Storm, JBL, Bob Holly thing? For the fans that don't know, um, there's basically something at OVW where Lance Storm told the young guys coming up um, that, that the wrestler court that's held there is stupid, and among other things, and the ribs are stupid, and it resulted in JBL yelling at Lance Storm at WrestleMania. What's, what's your opinion of that whole kind of hierarchy kind of thing going Ultimately, on? Ultimately, whether JBL and Bob, first of all, Bob Holly. Bob's, Bob just doesn't like to be ribbed. He doesn't want to rib anybody. Doesn't like to be ribbed. That's Bob. So Bob just wants to be left alone. Uh, JBL, I don't know. My whole thing is this: is where Lance is 100% wrong is, is Kangaroo Court. There's a reason we have it. When somebody isn't fitting in, somebody is do, is is not fitting into the group setting, which is what we talked about before. Why people get ribbed and stuff. But instead of ribbing you, they just give, they give you Kangaroo Court, which is much better than being ribbed. And if you're putting Kangaroo Court in your sentence and you got to buy a bunch of beer, how hard is that? But basically, there's a law of the land, and if you're going to be in that land, you have to follow that law. Whether you agree with it, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, it doesn't matter. You know, if the undertaker is, t is presiding over this court, then it's a legitimate court, because the undertaker has been in charge for God knows how long. If the undertaker is presiding over court and a court ruling is made, you abide by it. That's just the, I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're in fucking Arabia and you can't, and women have to be covered up, 
Who can't walk around with you know with a wet T-shirt? Oh, you know? in that society. Yeah, exactly. You know, and if you're in this society and you want to walk around with your dong hanging out, well, you'll probably get arrested, but you can do it. You know what I mean? Every every place is different. I mean, and that's part of the rules there. And Lance is absolutely wrong for Tom not to do it because a he's fuck because there's, there's there's two reasons why he's wrong. He's wrong because the, the you have to follow the laws of the land. Two, he's wrong because he's giving these guys erroneous information. So now these guys are like, first they've already fucked up to begin with. They fucked up enough. You don't just get put in kangaroo court for no reason, okay? It isn't just, hey, you know, to throw this guy in there. The only time that ever happens is if there's if the boys are so bored and business is so bad and things are just dragging that sometimes they drum up kangaroo court business. But for the most part, and I'd say 95% of the time, 90% of the time, kangaroo court's legit. And if Undertaker's presiding over it, it's legit. And, uh, you know, and so... Now he's given erroneous information, so these guys are already at heat to begin with. Now he's telling them, don't abide by the rules. They're fucking killing these guys. It's so unfair to these guys because they've already. Because now you're making them in. A, you're putting them in a double fuck up. You know what I mean? And so Lance is 100% wrong. I don't care whether he agrees with it or not. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. You know whether it's antiquated or barbaric. Because I think in many ways it serves its purpose. I think it can be abused. I think it can be uh, over. You know I don't think it's overused, but I think it can be abused. The system can always be abused. You know, but you pay for your freedom with vigilance. You know, and. Like that, you pay for your freedom with vigilance. <laughs> anyway, but it can, it can be abused, but I don't think it's overused because there's not that many cases of kangaroo court. But you tell a guy who doesn't know any better to begin with that he doesn't have to do something that he's already well, he's already fucked up enough to already have to do that. That's just bad. That's just wrong. And Lance is absolutely wrong for telling these guys that. You know, um, you know, if if he wanted to make a point or he wanted to make a stand, let's say Lance didn't like what was going on. Lance should have said, listen. I don't like what's going on. I don't agree with it. However, these are the rules. You need to follow them. My personal opinion is these guys are whatever I think of them. That's okay if you want to say that. You know what I mean? That's your opinion, what you think of those guys. But telling the boys to do something, not to do something that an undertaker presided, court, presided over court did, that's just wrong. You're just, you're just asking these guys to bury themselves, you know, hey, look, listen, it's only a four-foot hole. You need to dig it down to six so the coffin's completely underground. <laughs> you know, he's wrong, you know. Yeah. All right, a couple, a couple other things to tie in that you mentioned earlier uh, that you want to discuss. Um, number one, uh, why stars should go over on the indie shows. Oh, yeah, that's actually an important thing. Like, you know, I used to, when I, you know, I, I've had a name for a long, long time. And, you know, if I got an up-and-coming guy... You know, I used to put it, I used to like, hey, you know, whatever, if I just liked the guy, you know, whatever. I didn't even care. I, I never give a shit if I win or lose. I just put guys over. But what I found is, when you go to a show, an indie show, um, most indie shows, now there are some with five or six or ten indie, you know, you know, named guys. But for argument's sake, I'd say 85% of indie shows have two stars on it. Two, you know, named guys. And I don't count... No offense, I don't count Ring of Honor guys as name guys because I mean I'm talking about guys who've been WCW, WWF, and and not just guys like you know underneath like a guy who's been there. You know, no offense to Luther Reigns, but he's only was at the show for six months. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I'm talking about a guy who's been to the show, who's been pushed, you know, for a while. You know, like um, let's sing another guy who I wouldn't consider that. Um, um. Okay, um, all right, well, you know, there's basically, you know, there's, you basically shows up two guys. I'm trying to think of a, of a guy who'd be an underneath guy on a name show, like a guy who's been to the show but kind of underneath, who would, who's been on a show but really wouldn't be considered a name guy. You know what I mean? There's, you know what I'm saying? There's guys like that that, you know, been to the WWF or WCW for a year or two, but I mean, for the most part, the guy's headlining, you know, whether it's me or D'Lo or Al Snow or Lawler or Funk or Dusty, you know, we've put time in grade. We've been, uh, we've been to the show, either, either company or both, and I've worked for all four companies, WCW, ECW, WWF, and TNA. I've worked for all, four of them tw well, all three of them twice and TNA once. In fact, I think I'm the only guy in the business who has a doll at four major companies. <laughs> First guy ever. Um... I had a doll, ECW, WCW, WWE, and now I finally got a TNA doll. Uh, well, not finally, I mean, you know, the, the company just finally put them out. Hey, let me throw it over here. We'll advertise it. <laughs> the Raven doll. The short hair. I'm kind of like disco with the short hair. Good looking guy. 
Ooh, the first set is just AJ, Jeff, Abyss, and me. Click them all. Look, as a proof of purchase. Six foot, 225. I've been 225 in six years. Let's see. Quote the Raven Nevermore. The famous Edgar Allan Poe quote has served as Raven's trademark for many years. Ironically, Raven's legacy may mirror that of the famous writer as he borders on spiraling into madness. What? in his quest to achieve his self-described destiny to become NWA World Heavyweight Champion. Much like Jim Morrison's personality transcended music, Raven's career has transcended wrestling with a touch of pure evil. The superstar is actually pretty good. Da, 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 da. I like that. It's actually pretty good. Otherwise, arms swing up, too. <laughs> it's very important that your arm swings up. Look at that belly. They're not hearing the doll, though. The doll's got abs. <laughs> All right. Anyway, what are we talking about? Uh, the, the, why the, it starts to go around indie shows. Mm. So anyway, so most shows have two stars. Some have four, but for the most part, they have two. Maybe a buff Bagwell, whoever. Um, what happens is, this unless the guy has like a really big indie name and it's a really indie smart crowd, you put an indie guy over, the crowd gets upset. They crap on it. And so it's like when people go, um, you know, we need you to put so-and-so over, you know, I, I, I always say yes. I mean, but a lot of times, but, but late, in the last, you know, after a while, I started, after I started realizing the reactions of the people, I'm like, look, I don't mind putting them over, because it's awkward to say, because you don't want to come across like an egomaniac, because I don't mind losing at all, but, I mean, you know, it, it, this business has nothing to do with wins or losses. Um, but anyway, but I was like, yeah, but you, what happens is, let's say I'm wrestling, let's say Rich is, uh, Rich, are you, you going to score at all? Nah, you're going okay. to school. Okay, let's say you go to let's say Rich is let's say Rich has started having matches. And I wrestle Rich. And Rich beats me and they have no idea who the fuck Rich is. That's I mean part of the reason indie shows draw indie shows on the average, and I've studied this, they draw two hundred people. When you put a name on, you can draw above that. But for the most part, most indie shows and guys who run more than one time have a have an established fan base that usually never gets more than 200 people without stars. And you put some stars on and get the three or four hundred. Um, I'm lucky enough that, you know, I've proven, you know, that I can put more people in seats. Like Demore and Don Callis, they both are like, I hate to put Raven over. Uh, they're good friends right now. Like, I hate putting you over, but you actually put more people in seats. And, uh, so, but anyway, but so if you have a name guy and he's wrestling somebody they don't know, they're like, and the guy wins and you and they lose and, and the guy and the main guy loses, you're like, well, fuck. Part of the reason most fans come to see the show, okay, some fans are going to come anyway, but still, when there's a name, they're coming more importantly to see the name because that's obviously because you have a name. I mean, there's a reason why I have a name and Rich doesn't. You know, they and fans are much more interested in me than they are in him. And so to see the the name guy lose, it's pretty annoying unless he's losing to somebody. And I like now like a CM Punk in Ring of Honor. I put him over like what uh, seven times. Program too. Right, well, what I'm saying, but the difference is also your fans are very smart. They follow the business. They follow the indie scene. So they knew who Punk was. He wasn't like he's just a complete nobody. And the plan also was to take him from here to here. Although he claims that. He was already over that high before he before that, which is preposterous. <laughs> but yeah, that's why I'm wearing a shirt though. <laughs> Fuck him. Anyway, but he actually claims that too. He actually claims that I didn't help get him to the next level, which well, is absurd. That's a whole other debate for another. That time. is a huge <laughs> another debate. Um, that's a whole addition. That's but a whole you, right you concur there. with the point that I did, where Gabe? You two helped each other, but like I said, hey, how did he help me? He he got he got things going again with you. Yeah, so. on the indie scene. Uh, not really. Only with the smart fans. <laughs> but um. Anyway, well, I didn't say I didn't you say definitely elevated him. There's that, no I, I never that. said he didn't do anything for me. Yeah. All I said was I helped elevate him. And it, it was definitely mutual. Yeah. Anyway, the, um, which also proves that you can lose seven months in a row and still fucking end up getting more over. Yeah. Um, anyway, so with that, I don't mind losing because it's telling a story. It means something. People know who he is. You know what I mean? And they also, it's also a different fan base. Now in West Virginia. Plus seven months of bookings out of it too. It's right. a one shot deal. Right. But I'm saying, but, but yeah, exactly. Whereas in West Virginia, I was wrestling for Shady last week or two weeks ago. And, um, but I wrestled some guy, um, a real nice kid, skinny kid. We had a good little match. You know what I mean? And uh, actually for a funny little high spot is, uh, the original, uh, the original turnaround spot before we go home, before I make my comeback, was, it was he was going to shoot me off, duck the clothesline, super kick, right? And, uh, but then right before we went out, he changed it. He was going to miss a moonsault instead. And I totally forgot that we changed it. So after whatever the previous spot was, I feed up for the, for the, for the, to be shot off for the super kick. And I look up, and I, I don't see him anywhere. I'm like, and he's coming off to do a moonsault. I'm like, ah! <laughs> and I had to jump out of the way before I got landed on, like, the hard way. <laughs> 
And, and the boys in the back was like, hey, they go, hey, you really weren't in that good a position. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's always a different spot. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, the, um, but now, now he was a really nice kid. I would have had no problem putting him over. I mean, they never asked me to. But if, if, if he would have beaten me, the place would have just shit on it. Because they, they're like, they're, you know, even though people know wrestling is predetermined, they're agreeing to suspend disbelief. So if you're agreeing to suspend disbelief, you know, we know the Terminator's not real. And we know Archie's not real. But if Archie beat up the Terminator, he'd be like, come <laughs> on, what the fuck? You know, but, but that's what it is, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so you can't just put people over. And then also, one of my one of the people's favorite things of mine to do is, is the is the Raven effect, the DDT. And so Either I gotta get the guy after, the, and so they want to see that. I mean, it's like you know, that's why on indie shows, the guys are like, well, can't you beat me with a small package? First of all, I'm like, if I'm beating you, I'm beating you. Second of all, they want to see the even effect, the Raven effect. They don't come to see me small package. You know, a guy like Punk or somebody like that is different. You know what I mean? Or Samoa Fatty, who I got to wrestle coming up, because I'm gonna beat his fat ass. <laughs> Actually, I like him. Um, what am I wrestling? I forgot what I'm wrestling. I kick his fat ass. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, uh, let me tell you what he said. Well, I'll tell you I'll tell you that in a sec. But anyway, so the um, yeah, so it, it doesn't make any sense. Plus, that's what the people want to see. So they, it, it ruins it for them. Like, if you pay ten, fifteen bucks to see a star, and he gets beat by some nobody, and doesn't even get to use his signature move, which is why you use signature moves. Yeah. Was that in, was that in this lecture we talked about or the last no, one? That's the last one. So that's why another reason we have to signature moves. If we have time tonight, if not, we'll put on the next one. Signature moves are so fucking important. Um, and uh. And so the people want to see it. I mean, it's like if you go see, um, I remember I wanted to see Dennis Leary and fucking do a, a stand-up act. And that was right after he, um, he uh, had that, um, he, was, he, had this, he had these commercials on MTV. And he had these really, and he had this really great uh, catchphrase that fucking, um, I think you hear me knocking, I think I'm coming in, which I appropriated myself on TNA. I thought, I thought it was, and in fact, the, um, and so what he would say is, uh, he would do this whole bit. They, they shot him in black and white. They were really edgy at the time with him smoking up a storm, which nobody smoked on TV back then. And he's smoking up a chimney. And he's like, uh, he goes, and he'd be like, it's not this, it's not that. He goes, I think you hear me knocking. I think I'm coming. You know, I got two words for you, lung cans or whatever. And then, the, then they even did a parody where Cindy, because he always talked about how hot Cindy Crawford was because she was like the supermodel of the day. And they even do a parody with Cindy Crawford she, who had her own show, The House of Style. She says, it's not the apartment of style. It's not the condo of style. It's the house of style. I got two words for you. Dennis Leary, lung cancer. I think you hear me knocking. I think I'm coming in. And so he built this whole catchphrase. So we go see him in concert. He fucking didn't say it. He didn't say it. I was fucking pissed. You know, if you go see a concert, if you go see fucking um, the uh, whoever, if you go see Leonard Skinner and they don't play Freebird, what the fuck? You know, you're fucking pissed. I mean, I remember going to see Jethro Tull back in 82 at the Spectrum. And, uh, I mean, it was, the concert was phenomenal, but they only played four hits. I was so pissed. I'm like, they got a catalog of at least 20 recognizable songs. They played four. I was fucking livid. You know, Neil Young was one of my favorite artists. He plays what he wants to play. I'm like, bullshit. It's like Kiss says, hey, the people paid to see this, the hit songs. Fuck your fucking, uh, your brooding mentality. You know, paraphrasing. You know, fuck your personal bullshit. Play the fucking shit they want to hear. You know? And so the people want to see signature moves. If you go there and, you know, if I go see a Conan match, I want to see him do a somersault clothesline. I want to see him go, Arriba la basa. That's like we got Shane Douglas on the show on Sunday. All the people want to see is a belly to belly. Yeah, they want to see him go, ma. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> right, but I'm saying, yeah, so, you know, so now you're depriving them of what they came to see, and they, they certainly don't want to see, you know, their stars lose when they find, you know, especially in these small towns where they're never going to go to a big show. The big show's never going to come to their town. They're never going to be able to afford to bring their family or, you know, make the, the headache and the drive and the whole nine yards of driving two hours to St. Louis or whatever the nearest town is, major town, to a major arena and see the whole show. So what they're going to see, this is the best they got. They don't want to see their fucking stars get fucking beat by a bunch of local nobodies especially half the time when local nobodies aren't very built they usually have either bellies or they're skinny they have cheap looking outfits they have no fucking star presence no charisma they may be good hands but that's about it that's the last thing people want to see so it's you know and that's why stars really shouldn't lose on indie shows generally you know, and this is why you always ask why why? Now that you understand it, because if you just if I just said stars should never lose on indie shows, then you would never have. If you could listen to me, you would never have stars lose. And then there are times when it applies, like in Ring of Honor, like the Punk scenario. If um, let's say uh, the local town, let's say there's a local um, 
market, let's say, Bumblefuck Egypt, right? And fucking in Bumblefuck Egypt, they built up some guy named fucking the, uh, the mummy. And the mummy fucking, you know, and they run shows every month. And the same two, three, four hundred people come every month, and the mummy wins every month, and he's the world champion. And now maybe they bring a star in. Okay, maybe then the, the star loses because the people know who the mummy is, you know, and they know the mummy's, you know, walks and got magical powers. <laughs> well, maybe not that part. But you see my the point? The local guy's over. Yeah, the local guy's over, you know, so that makes sense sometimes, you know. But for the most part, you know, and then the other bad thing about indie booking is that, like, they'll put two stars in a show and they won't put them against each other. Insanity. Like, I I've been on shows where you know, it's like me and Buffer are two indie guys and me and Buffer wrestle on two other guys and I'm like, D and they're advertising it that way. Now if you're a fan, do you want to see me against some nobody and Buff against some nobody or do you want to see me against Buff? You know, you want to see me against Buff or me against Funk or whatever. You don't want to see, you know, a name guy versus like nobody. Tag. There was no reason for Vordell Walker and Eric Stevens to be in that tag with Dustin Rhodes and Rick Steiner anyways. Uh, however, there, there, actually, there's not a bad exception now. I, and I'll tell you why. That's actually, I disagree with you on that for this reason why. Well, okay, well, I don't know I don't know what that town, but there are reasons for that exception. I'll tell you why. In a tag, now you can put the local kids in with them to give them a rub if you run there quite a bit. Now, if they run, if they run the floor of that town and they run that area a lot, a lot, a lot, and they have local TV, and they're trying to do a little something. That's not a bad way to give them a rub, but if they're just having a show, then I absolutely agree with you. You know, so that, and that's why the question why is so important. You know, if you don't know why you're doing something, you know, like E equals MC squared. Everybody knows that that formula from Einstein. E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. But nobody really knows what it fucking means, you know, or why it works. And so you couldn't really understand it unless you know why, you know. You could say, oh, yeah, E equals MC squared. Well, what does it mean? I don't know. You know, and then even if you do know what it means, that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light, you couldn't explain it to anybody unless you knew why. You know, and the why is, the, to me, the why is almost always the most important question. Um, like, why the fuck am I doing this? Because <laughs> I like money. No, because actually I, I want to teach people. You know, and you should always ask why. You have to ask why politely. You can't just go, hey, why the fuck am I doing that? But you should ask why. Like, uh, okay, let me ask you a question. Um, and, you know, and there's always a polite way to find out anything you want to know. Like, let's say you're working with me, and I can be a crabby bastard sometimes, and let's say that I want to do a certain particular thing. And, uh... And let's say maybe I haven't put any thought into it whatsoever, and you actually have a much better idea, you know, but you don't want to insult me. So you're like, so you don't go, hey, listen, why the fuck are we doing that? Why don't we do this? You would say, hey, listen, Raven, um, that's a really good idea. I love it. Except let me ask you a question. What do you think of this? And that's how you present things. There's always a way. Like, I mean, there are so many times when fucking I've, I've heard finishes, you know, when I wasn't the, the senior guy in the room that are just so crap ass. And I'm just like, and I'm just, ugh. And I'm just like, so, I, and out of respect, I'm like, all right, I go, hey, listen, that's great. Well, listen, I was just thinking, um, let me ask you this. What about, what do you think? And, and you, and this, this is how they, this is how they taught me in the business. They said, make it, make the booker think it's his idea. Hey, it's the, you can't ever lose that way. So let's say Gabe gives me this is a really stupid idea. Gabe's like, all right, listen, we're going to do this, this, and this. I'm like, that's great, Gabe. Listen, I love that. Listen, let me ask you a question. What do you, what do you think if we, if we did something like, and let him fill, and leave him where you want him to go, let him fill in the blanks, because if it's that much better and the guy's any good, he'll figure it out on his own. So let's say I want Gabe to say, uh, Rich, over with the fucking, um, the camera up his ass, right? And But he wants to have the other guy over with the camera, you know, not up Rich's ass. And I'm like, great, Gabe, that's a great idea. But listen, um, if we put Joe Blow over, that works really well. But suppose, what, I don't know, I was just thinking, what if Rich, what, suppose the camera's up his ass, and Gabe's like, yes, the camera's up his ass, and Rich goes over. I love it. And he's like, hey, he tells his buddy, yeah, I just came up with this great idea. The, that's that's what uh, that's what the booker's supposed to do with the wrestlers too. Is let the wrestlers think that they're coming up with the ideas. No, he's not. That's, no, that's, he's that's 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 what I, I always. That's actually what Terry Funk uh, told me one time. He he gave me this whole speech. But that's another thing for another time. Um. Okay. That's not the way it was ever done. Then that's actually it, it, it should be. You're right. But that's not the way it was ever done. Basically, the booker just said you're doing this. Yeah. I was always lucky enough that they let me write my own shit. But for the most part. The, the reason, actually, but here's, here's why I disagree, and this is the only reason I disagree. Okay, this is why the, the question why is so important, because there are caveats, which means, uh, um, caveat, there's, uh, pre, there's, uh, bleh. There's uh, exceptions to every rule. You know, there's, uh, there's a disclaimer to every rule. And the reason why is, 
Top guys, yes, that's a completely different story. You want top guys to have input. You still don't want them thinking they. You want them. You want to. Okay. It's a give and take. It's, right. It's yeah. a give and take. But here's the thing: is the low top guys. No, you don't want them to know what they're doing. Yeah. And I'll tell you why. And here, here's this is one of the odds and ends I wanted to talk about. Actually, this probably comes in a book. I'll just give a quick little nod to it. Um, the, what do we got left on time? Five, Five minutes. All right. This is a quick little nod here. Um, the reason why people are never told what they're doing until the last minute is because the boys fucking, they never like it. They, a, they never like what they're doing. B, they don't like when they're not going over. C, even when they are going over, they think they can do it a better way. It's like, it's like, listen, how can I beat you in two falls and still look strong? No, two out of three falls. How can I beat you two falls straight and still look strong? Uh, you are looking strong already. Um, you couldn't look any stronger. You beat me two straight falls. Um, and so... Because of that, basically, the boys are always, they're always going to see things in their way. And, and the thing is, is, okay, if you tell them they're going to do something, and three, this is what you do next week, the week after, week after that. They're like, oh, okay. And then they leave, and they're like, oh, I don't really like that. I, I don't want to do that. I, I got to lose in two weeks. Fuck that. They come back, oh, let me change this. And to try and explain to them that the reason we're doing this is because not only are we thinking about your program, we're thinking about his program and somebody else's. Everybody just thinks it's their own little microcosm is everything that they're worried about. This is one little avenue. There's so many other things that pertain to it because you can't do this maybe because maybe you want to have a cage match, but you can't because they're having a cage match. There's so many other things that go into booking that is a whole other lecture. My point being is you don't want the boys to know. You're much better off the boys get there and they're told what to do until they get your respect enough that they're that they're qualified until you have enough mutual respect that you know you can tell them and they're not going to cry about it or piss and moan or try and change it or bitch about it or whatever um and until they get high enough on the card which is also which is being over they're not in any position they're just like their their job is to help draw the house. You know, the, the main, the, basically the business has always been the main event draws the house, the rest of the card is the dressing. It's kind of like, um, you can have a great card and you'll draw X amount of people. You put a great main event on top, you're going to draw X amount more. Take the main event off, you're going to draw X amount less. Now, if you just have the main event without anything, you're only going to draw a certain amount. You always draw more with the whole with a whole card, which is you know the Eddie Graham philosophy. You build the whole everything from the first match up, but ultimately it's the main event that puts that final, the last, the largest, and the last big chunk of seats in. So you need so that's why they're in a different position. The rest of the people are dressing, and a lot of them are not that they're interchangeable, but they are to an extent. You know, mid card matches, third or fourth in the bottom. You know. You could probably get half the time you can get pretty much any two people to throw in those stories a lot of times Unless you have characters that are breakout characters or characters, which is why being a character and a star is so important um, But ultimately for the most part You should be pretty much when you get there you find out and Gabe says all right look this is where we're going This is what I need you to do this tonight, you know, and then when you finally get to a spot where he's like all right listen I want to get to here. How do you want to get there? How about this idea? Well, how about that idea? How about this? How about that? And you build on each other's stuff to come up with the best possible thing. That's at a different level. Everybody thinks they're at that level. That's part of being a you know a veteran and a greenhorn is you work your way up to that level and you work up to that respect. Um, I was lucky enough that even though I was loud and obnoxious, for, the, for my by the time I got to Portland, which is a year in a business, which was 11 months in the business, after three four months, I was getting to write my like. Co contribute to my own programs and then I wrote my own uh, one of my favorite storylines I ever did was this wedding angle I did where I dumped the bitch at the altar <laughs> and, uh, and I did some really bad singing too and because uh, I sung to her and uh, actually it was a great game I brought out a little banaka I was like me, 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 me. right and I was like man you are the sunshine of my life yeah I just sing really badly, right? And then, like, I didn't know all the words. I'm like, when I did, did, you are the sunshine. And it was so embarrassingly cringing. Like, I watch it back, and, and it's just it's creepy to watch. Because it's like that show, The Office, where it's <laughs> creepy to watch because it's so realistic. And it's so real, and it's so bad. But it's so, it's so badly real. And you're like, that... 
it's actually it leads to a funny little high spot. So I ended up proposing to the girl. She she agreed like you know and this this is not I go two minutes. This is how you this is how you tell a story. The uh, this is part of booking. Is uh, so I ask her to marry. I go to ask her to marry me. I get on one knee and I get attacked. So I can't ask her. The next week I go to. It's, it's, we built this up for three months of me giving her flowers and everything. I'm trying to hurry up because I got two minutes. Then the next week I go to I get on one knee. Will you marry me? I'll let you know next week. <laughs> so the next week, will you marry me? Yes, I will. We'll get married the next week. And uh, the um, the uh, uh, you made me forget what I was, you made me rush. I forget what I was talking about. What was I talking about? The um, wait, what's the high spot? You fucker. <laughs> anyway, I dumped her at the altar. Man, you made me forget. So wait, the um. Ah, oh, I hate when I draw blanks like that. I forgot what the fucking. Uh, Go to fucking uh, propose to her, fucking sing to her. Anyway, so I sing to her, fucking, and so cringe. Oh, I know what it was. So it's so cringe worthy. And then when I finally proposed to her, so this what? So I go to a the nightclub. How much time I got? I got. I'll burn. It. Yeah, you can, okay. you so I get right down to the. So I like running down to the wire, just like on TV. <laughs> anyway, so it's so cringeworthy. So the next week I'm at a, at a at the, at the local nightclub right where I'm hanging out, and this girl comes up to me. She's like, "Listen," she goes, "I've always been in love with you. I, I, I can't believe you're going to get married." She goes, "I'm so depressed." She goes, "I'm, I'm going to have to go home and sleep with you." And she actually went home and I, and I fucked her that night, strictly on the promise, strictly because she legitimately believed, because because how realistically bad this was. I mean, not that it was bad, but it was so realistic and so cringe worthy that it had to be real that she really thought I was getting married and she wanted to sleep with me before I got married <laughs> well on that note we'll end this edition of Secrets of the Ring with Raven and we will be back with many Five, more editions three, two, and we're out thank you <laughs>
Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. I was fucked up. I was fucked up. Fuck you, baby. Yeah, shit.